In the presence of a quorum, I'm going to call this meeting of the Acton Board of Selectmen to order. Um, I'm going to start by first announcing that um, tonight's uh, meeting is actually being um, broadcast on Comcast Channel 8, which is the public channel, as there is an issue with Comcast on the government channel. So if anybody um, is trying to watch from home, hopefully you have figured it out that it is on Channel 8. Um, so I'll begin by reading the public hearing notice. The Acton Board of Selectmen will hold a public hearing on April 23rd, 2008, April 26, 2018 at 7 p.m., continued from March 29th, 2018, in the Francis Faulkner Hearing Room 204 at Town Hall 472 Main Street, Acton, related to a draft modified use and special permit decision number 11, 2015-459, pursuant to sections 10.3, special permit, 10.4, site plan, 3.4.7, other public use, and other provisions of the Acton Zone bylaw concerning Concord's proposed upgraded public water supply treatment facility and related infrastructure at 180 and 182 Skyline Drive, Acton, Mass. on Nagog Pond. The draft modified decision that will be the focus of the public hearing as well as related materials, including materials previously submitted to the Board of Selectmen during its previously conducted public hearings on Concord's application can be inspected at Town Hall during normal business hours. Okay, so I think most of us have uh, been to at least one or two of these public hearings before, so you know the drill, but quickly I will go over a little bit of how we will structure tonight. It will be very similar to um, the last uh, reopened hearing that we had in November of 2017. Um, so I will begin by just giving a quick overview and turn it over to um, Town Council Je Jeff Roloffs. Um, special counsel who will explain a bit about the process, the events leading to tonight, and um, a brief introduction of the draft revisions to uh, the Board of Selectmen decision. I will then allow selectmen to make any um, introductory remarks that they may want to, um, and then turn it over to the Concord representatives to make any presentation that they have, and then open it up to public comment. Um, one group has requested to go first, so I will allow them to present first, and then open it up um, just to the public in general. Followed by that, we will have more Board of Selectmen questions and discussions. Um, and so again, ground rules tonight in terms of public comment. Normally, we don't put any um, limits on time limits on public comment, but due to the large number of people uh, here tonight, uh, we would ask that um, comments be kept to two minutes. Um, and uh, except for the longer that I've prearranged with the, with the one group beforehand. Um, I will allow some flexibility with that. Um, and again, follow-up comments will generally not be allowed except at my discretion. And I really uh, want to emphasize that, you know, we've been at this for two and a half years. We've uh, heard a number of public comments. We've all um, read all of them and been to or watched all of these public hearings. And so we'd ask that people do not um, elaborate on on points that have already been made, um, and to, to if you if you want to say that you're supporting uh, previous comments, please just say that instead of reiterating those, and try to keep your comments to anything new. And um, this is important. We will not be allowing any interruptions or disruptions, including applause, as this is a hearing. It's a legal proceeding as part of ongoing litigation. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Special Counsel Jeff Roloffs. Thank you, Jeff Roloffs, uh, Special Counsel to the Town of Acton and Acton Board of Selectmen. Uh, so I'd just like to give a quick chronology. Most of you know it, but for anyone uh, listening or here uh, who's not familiar with it, uh, a few remarks on the scope of the hearing tonight, and then I'll quickly go through the revisions to the modified decision uh, with a focus on those since the November 2017 hearing. So um, in March... 2017, the Board of Selectmen issued their original decision in this uh, matter, approving the applications of Concord subject to various conditions. Concord filed an appeal in land court challenging some of those conditions. Primary arguments there being that the conditions that they were challenging were preempted by state law and or for other reasons beyond the scope of the board's authority as a zoning entity which it's acting in. Uh, in, in its, the capacity it's acting in in these proceedings. Uh, following the filing of that appeal, the party's uh, representatives for the Acton Board of Selectmen in Concord engaged in extensive settlement discussions which led to a set of proposed or draft uh, modifications to the original decision. 
Those modifications were the subject of a public hearing in November 2017. I believe most of you were here. Uh, it was a two night, uh, there were two hearings, November 20 and 29, leading to a decision uh, where three of the selectmen voted to approve the modifications. Two of them uh, did not support them, and because the vote required four supporting votes, the modifi mo that modified decision was not approved, and so a decision reflecting that uh, disapproval was filed with the city clerk, and it was incorporated into the land court appeal. Uh, subsequent to that, the parties engaged in additional settlement discussions, and there really were two focuses uh, of those discussions. There was some focus on further uh, refinement of the modifications to the special permit decision, but most of the focus was on trying to address the Great Road Route 2A water supply issues and other regional water supply coordination issues in a separate document, separate from this special permit uh, decision. Those efforts led to the selectmen for Concord and Acton executing an intermunicipal agreement. That agreement, um, for reasons I'm, that w we discussed at length before, were um, that agreement was made subject to approval by the Acton Town Meeting. Acton Town Meeting ultimately rejected the agreement, so the agreement uh, did not take effect. Uh, however, uh, simultaneously, the parties were working on further revisions to the special permit decision. That led to uh, the parties jointly requesting a remand from the land court so that they could conduct this public hearing focused on the additional modifications to the special permit. So uh, the original hearing on these modifications was scheduled for March 29th. Some residents objected to the hearing being conducted that evening because it was Holy Thursday. The board uh, scheduled a meeting to consider that objection and decided prior to the 29th to open the hearing on the 29th but not to accept any substantive presentations. Um, and then to continue the hearing to a date certain. So on March 29th, that's exactly what the board did. They opened the hearing. Um, they did not accept any substantive discussions related to the applications. They continued the hearing to tonight, April 26th. In the meantime, and between the 29th and here, some, there were some significant events that took place. Two, one of which is uh, Selectman Chang's term ended, and Selectman Benson is now uh, has been elected and his term has now begun. So Selectman Benson is uh, new to the board here, um, but I can assure you that he is up to speed. I think he had been keeping up to speed as matters proceeded, and he has made a, a very significant effort to uh, get up to speed with respect to the details, and I'll let him speak to that. Um, the second is that there was the annual town meeting at which the intermunicipal agreement that the parties had executed was not supported and therefore didn't take effect. Okay, so that's the chronology. With respect to the scope of the hearing, uh, it's very similar. I'm not going to go through all of the um, sort of background that I went through in November because it's a similar context. The scope of the hearing is whether or not to, uh, the board wants to approve the draft modifications to the, the original special permit decision. It's not a reopening of the original decision. Uh, it's not a, a reconsideration of the original decision, uh, that is, whether or not to approve it or not. The focus is on the modifications that have been drafted and presented to the public um, through the, uh, that they've been posted for a few weeks. And let me just tune you into those modifications. On, uh, there was a first set of modifications posted and circulated to interested parties on March 22nd. Those modifications, um, were subsequently updated on April 19th in a very minor way, but, it, but we updated the draft modified decision to reflect the, the events since March 22nd, being the annual town meeting, you know, the execution of the IMA, the annual town meeting, et cetera, and there was some minor uh, tweaking of some of the language uh, in the modification. But most recently in the documents that you should have tuned into for tonight, there really are four documents that have been posted, and let me just explain what they are. All of them are reflect the April 19 draft modifications. 
there's a clean version of an April 19 draft modified decision. There's a red line version that compares that document to the, the uh, previously posted March 22nd decision. So you can see the few refinements that we made over the last few weeks. There's a red line version that compares the April 19 version to the November 2017 draft decision. So you can see what changes have been made and proposed since the November 2017 hearing. And there's a red line version that compares the April 19 draft to the March 2017 decision. That larger set of redlining, that larger set of modifications is the subject of the hearing tonight. So you're not confined to the more recent ones, but we wanted to get you each of these pieces so that you were aware of the different iterations and the different revisions that were made. Okay, so going to, I'm not gonna focus any comments on the modifications that were already presented to the board and to the public in November. Um, we discussed those at length and they've been, they've been available for a long time. So uh, what I do wanna tune you into though are the revisions that were made since the November 2017 draft decision. And they're not hugely significant and this is because again, the, the, the greater part of the effort was focused on addressing the Route 2A water supply and the regional planning efforts through a separate document being that intermunicipal agreement. But with respect to this decision since November 2017, minor revisions were made to the condition related to chemical de deliveries. They weren't very significant. Um, and, I'm, and unless somebody wants to go through the, I don't think anyone wants to go through, through these piece by piece. They've been available for a couple of weeks. We could put it up if somebody feels the, the need for that. but. Those revisions were pretty minor. There were some, there was an, a withdrawal reporting provision that was added to the decision. And through this, this provision requires Concord to provide a copy of its individual surface water source statistics report for Nagak Pond um, to the Acton Water District and the Acton Health Department at the same time that it provides these to the mass DEP folks. And it's basically a report. It's publicly available anyways, but it facilitates the exchange and contempor contemporaneous exchange of data that reflects the withdrawal activities of Concord at Nagog Pond. Um, there was a provision 3.3, it had been 337, related to the protection of the environment. And let me just discuss this one quickly. The, Change there was to uh, make it clear that the selectmen were requiring Concord to comply with applicable state and federal laws and regulations, existing and future, that was a clarification that we added, regarding the protection of the environment and natural resources, including but not limited to uh, the Wastewater Management Act. And then we added some language that states as follows. And number two, otherwise in a manner that appropriately prevents significant damage to the environment in or adjacent to Nagak Pond. Um, there's some additional language there which reflects the fact that Concord objects to this provision, that it's, in, in particular that, that the language that I just quoted. Um, it's their view that this uh, requirement that they, uh, that they operate its facility in a manner that appropriately prevents damage to the environment in the pond or adjacent to it is, uh, inconsi is, is something that the board can't do. It's beyond the board's authority. And rather than deleting it or litigating it, we've included language in here that says, we want to impose this condition. We understand Concord thinks it's beyond the Act and Board of Selectmen's authority. Um, rather than forcing you to appeal it or waive your rights on that issue, we're acknowledging Concord's position on the point and we're retaining the condition. Basically, in the future, if there's a situation that leads the Board of Selectmen to want to enforce that provision, Concord has, through the language we've proposed, Concord would retain its right to argue that the condition was beyond the Board's authority. So it may be an issue that never has to be litigated, or if it is, it's gonna have, it would happen at some point in the future, not right now. And then we added uh, some additional, we elaborated in the provision related to 
water supply coordination and planning, requiring Concord to actively and in, in good faith engage in periodic meetings with the water district and the town of Acton. And we elaborated, we pulled in some language into this provision that had been included in the intermunicipal agreement, um, which again, that hasn't taken effect. So we folded some of that language into the proposed draft uh, modified decision. And then we did also make some minor uh, language changes to the paragraph related to Concord's obligation to uh, coordinate with the uh, Acton Natural Resources Conservation Department and the Acton Land Stewardship Committee related to trails on uh, potentially on its property and adjacent land. And we've included references there requiring them to discuss the possibility of establishing a connection between Breezy Point uh, and Acton's Nagak Hill Conservation Land. Um, and really that's it. So it's a pretty limited, pretty limited change. So that, that really is the list of substance and changes, substantive changes that have been made since November. But again, all of the changes that were uh, presented at that time are before the board tonight. So I think with that, Katie, that's all I have. Thank you. Great, thank you, Jeff. Um, so before I move on, just for folks standing, just so you know, there are a number of empty seats over here. So if you wanna make your way over, um, please do. Um, okay, and I will turn it over to uh, representatives from Concord to make any comments or presentation that you would like to make. May, may I just make a statement first? Oh, yes. as, as to oh I'm sorry, yes, I'm supposed <laughs> Yeah. You are correct on um, my timing, yes. Thank you. I'm allowing selectmen first to um, make statements. In, in terms of my preparation and getting up to speed for, for this evening, um, I um, accessed Acton Cable and view, watched the entirety of those hearings with substantive presentations. This would include the hearings on January 25th, 2016, September 12th, 2016, November 1, 2016, January 18, 2017, March 23, 2017, which was the final vote on the uh, decision that s stands. Um, I attended the remand hearing on November 20th, 2017 until about 10 o'clock and, and then watched the full four hours and 18 minutes of that hearing again um, last week. Um, and I watched the final, the November 29, 2017 hearing where the vote that failed. I took extensive notes of those videos and have reread them several times. It was probably about 30 or so hours of videos that I watched. And I can do a great Bob Sekula presentation. <laughs> um, I also supplemented it um, by reviewing the submissions um, made by Acton residents, the town of Concord. Uh, this included um, both uh, online for the uh, November 20 to 17 hearing, and I spent a better part of a day downstairs in the um, land use department looking at the hard copies because of many documents that, that Concord had uh, presented that were bound, and that was the easiest way to do it. So I could say that I'm comfortably I'm up to speed on this. Thank you, John. Um, are there any other introductory comments that other selectmen want to make? Okay. Um, and with that, I'll just first thank John for all of his efforts that he's gone through to get up to speed on this. You know, I think some of us forget that we've been living this for two and a half years. Um, I was actually chair of the first hearing when this started, so it's a bit of a full circle uh, that we've come around to, to me back in the seat again. Um, but uh, John has really spent significant hours in the recent weeks uh, getting up to speed and making sure that he's read every comment and document that, that's come in and, and we're really appreciative of that. Okay, so now with that, I will turn it over to Concord representatives. Thank you, Katie. And John, thanks for taking that time. I'm glad that I went out and bought a new tie so you wouldn't have to see uh, one of those repeats. Great, I think I should be able to get it out. 
So I want to thank, my name is Peter Durning. I'm counsel for the town of Concord. I'm with the law firm of Mackie Shea. And I want to thank the Acton Board of Selectmen and their chair, Katie Green. I didn't realize that you were there at the first hearing, Katie. I was going to say that I was, uh, you know, we've gone through three chairs now, but I guess it's four, full circle, you're right. Um, and I do want to thank uh, the full board for its time and consideration of this important matter and for conducting an orderly and informative meeting as you have throughout this process. I'd also like to recognize the members of Concord Town Government that are present here this evening as a show of their commitment um, of the work of the Concord Water Department and their deference to your authority with respect to the siting of this facility in Acton. Many of these individuals and the representatives of Concord have worked hard to craft the draft modified permit that is the subject of the hearing this evening. Concord and Acton invested significant commitment of time and effort to vet these issues over many meetings and negotiations. The proposed modified special permit decision reflects the full, frank, and creative exchange of facts, opinions, and ideas, and is a collaborative compromise that achieves the goals of both Acton and Concord. It is our hope that the process and the discussions also forged an improved relationship between the towns that they can carry forward into other areas. My presentation will highlight some of the provisions that involved from the first remand hearing in November, as Jeff has described. And while my presentation will focus on some of the areas where further compromise was negotiated, it is important to understand that none of the elements of the first recommended modified decision were adopted by the board's three to two vote in November. Today, Concord is asking the board to adopt all of the proposed changes to correct the unacceptable elements of the original March 29, 2017 decision, which is currently the subject of litigation pending in the land court. Concord is confident that the suggested revisions to the conditions honor both the special permit criteria in the Acton Zoning Bylaws and Concord's registration rights. It's important to note that the modifications are limited in scope to the extent the board and Acton residents raised legitimate zoning concerns during the permitting process, including concerns of noise impacts or aesthetics, Concord has addressed and responded to those concerns. In particular, Concord eliminated the proposed solar array and the use of cogeneration units in response to public comments. In addition to the evolution of the project over time, there are numerous conditions in the special permit which Concord did not appeal. Certain uh, provisions including noise mitigation and compliance testing, for example, that are designed to ensure compliance with the siting criteria and act in zoning bylaw. That being said, there are some conditions, particularly those that concern the volume of Concord's water withdrawals, that do not fall under the jurisdiction of the Board of Selectmen serving as a special permit granting authority. Accordingly, Concord brought an appeal to protect its rights. Thanks, Alan. <clears throat> on April 13, 2017, Concord filed an appeal under General Laws, Chapter 40A, Section 17, seeking judicial review of the March 29, 2017 decision issued by the Acton Board of Selectmen for the approval of a special permit and a slight plan special permit for an infrastructure project to update Concord's public drinking water treatment plant located at 180, 182 Skyline Drive, Acton, near Nagog Pond. Ordinarily, an approval uh, is a positive result, but when conditions are imposed that undermine the ability to finance, build, and operate a project, the approval may be too onerous to accept. And that was the situation here. Concord filed the appeal because although the board's approval decision, because the board's approval decision contains certain conditions that were preempted by the Water Management Act, were arbitrary and capricious, exceeded the authority of the board under the Zoning Act and bylaw, were ultra vires, deferred critical issues to subsequent decisions, and imposed enforcement measures which exceeded the requirements of the Zoning Act. As I have mentioned on numerous occasions during this process, the Water Management Act, which was passed in 1986, preempted local control over water withdrawals. The Water Management Act was adopted to establish a unified statewide system to regulate water withdrawals. Section three of the Water Management Act gave the mass Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection the authority to, quote, adopt such regulations as Mass DEP deems necessary to carry out the purposes of the act, establishing a mechanism for managing 
ground, and surface water in the Commonwealth as a single hydrological system and ensuring, where necessary, a balance among competing water withdrawals and uses. Concord's complaint in the land court alleged that despite the uncontroverted evidence in the record before the Acting Board of Selectmen, that Concord holds a registration under the Waterman An Management Act for its withdrawals from Nagog Pond, the board imposed several conditions on the project designed to limit Concord's exercise of those rights. The March 29, 2017 decision was also arbitrary and capricious, particularly when compared to the board's special permit and variance issued for Concord's ozone treatment facility at the same location in 1994. The decision exceeded the authority of the board as a special permit granting authority under the Zoning Act and the Act and Zoning Bylaw in many respects, particularly with respect to the enforcement provision in Section 332. The board imposed the following conditions regarding water withdrawal rights that violated Concord's rights under the Water Management Act and exceeded the authority of the board. Section 337, regarding the monitoring program, Section 338, the protection of environment and water supplies, and Section 339, water supply coordination and planning. These are the areas that are the primary focus of the additional changes in the modified special permit decision. With respect to Section 337 on monitoring, this section in the original decision was a complex arrangement of provisions for monitoring and policing Concord's withdrawals. In addition to forcing Concord to develop a monitoring and reporting program without any clear parameters, the original section imposed obligations on Concord which were tied to the enforcement provision with its potential revocation power for the duration of the operation of the facility. In addition to exceeding the Board of Selectmen Zoning Authority and deferring critical decisions of operating the facility off into the future, the original monitoring condition violated Concord's registration rights under General Laws Chapter 21G, Section 5, the registration provision of the Water Management Act, that, establishes, that established Concord's withdrawal rights regardless of alleged impacts on other potentially hydrologically connected, interconnected water sources. The detailed monitoring requirements in the original decision and the public comments to impose stringent withdrawal limits on Concord's water treatment plant at Nagog Pond ignored the fact that the Water Management Act was specifically designed and intended to provide a framework of comprehensive management of ground and surface water withdrawal in Massachusetts. The legislative record for the Water Management Act, including the 1983 report of the Special Commission established by the State Senate to make investigation and study relative to determining the adequacy of water supply in the Commonwealth, Senate Report number 1826, it's clear that the Water Management Act was intended to occupy the field regarding withdrawals of water in the Commonwealth. As proposed in the Special Commission Report, the Water Management Act was adopted to establish one statewide uniform system for authorizing and managing water withdrawals. In its filings and adjudicatory hearings, MassDEP has endorsed the conclusion that the Water Management Act occupies the field regarding withdrawals of water in the Commonwealth and that the Water Management Act is comprehensive as to the regulation of withdrawals from both ground and surface waters. Giving a local zoning authority the ability to regulate water withdrawals would dramatically undermine the entire premise of the Water Management Act. Thus, the conditions regarding monitoring in Section 337 of the decision that would police and regulate Concord's withdrawals from Nagog Pond violate the provisions of the Water Management Act and exceed the Board's authority. The original 337, Section 337, was also arbitrary and capricious. In addition to violating Concord's registration, the imposition of the monitoring program is arbitrary and capricious. The March 29, 2017 decision is not consistent with the 1994 variance and special permit issued by this board. With respect to the withdrawals from Nagog Pond, there's no difference between the current circumstance and the 1994 zoning approvals. The proposed rate of the volume of the withdrawal was similar, and that was not a matter subject to the Board of Selectmen's authority. The board concluded that the 1994 variance and special permit complied with the requirements of the Zoning Act and the Zoning Bylaw, as they should in this project. As an illustration, I think you hit it one more time, Helen, please. Um, 
At the time of the 1994 special permit invariance, um, I have this document from MassDEP that reviewed, it's called the approval for disinfection facility at Nagog Pond. This is in relation to the ozone treatment facility that was the subject of the special permit invariance. And in the body of this document, it states that the facility, the ozone treatment facility, will consist of a 1.5 million gallon per day potable water disinfection facility. That is the same design capacity as the system before you. There was no conditions imposed in the 1994 approvals regulating Concord's water withdrawals or placing any other limitation on its ability to operate a treatment facility that had a design capacity of 1.5 million gallons per day. Therefore, the sections of this, the original decision, the March 29, 2017 decision, that seek to impose those limitations are arbitrary and capricious. Furthermore, as Council for Acton mentioned in his comments during the hearing on November 20th, 2017, Concord did not submit the issue of its water withdrawals to the board. Concord's withdrawals from Nagog Pond are subject to a different regulatory scheme, not zoning approvals. While the board could review issues under the Zoning Act and bylaw to determine if the site was appropriate for water treatment facility, Concord's authorization to withdraw water from Nagog Pond was not before the board and the board should not have imposed conditions seeking to regulate Concord's withdrawals. While Concord strenuously objects to the board imposing restrictions on the operation and management of Concord's water withdrawal as a compromise in the proposed modified decision, Concord agrees to provide Acton with a copy of its public water supply annual statistical report. This is an annual submission that Concord provides to MassDEP and it gives a look back at the withdrawals from the facility for the prior calendar year. Pursuant to the proposed language in the modified decision, Concord will submit a copy of the annual report to the Acton Water District and the Acton Health Department contemporaneously with the submission to the Bureau of Water Resources Drinking Water Program at MassDEP. The annual report provides sufficient data to assess the total volume of water Concord withdraws for drinking water purposes on a yearly and monthly basis, which in turn also provides an estimated average daily withdrawal. In addition, the annual report also provides the date and volume of the maximum single day withdrawal. This annual report was selected to address the concerns that had been articulated by Selectman Chang, particularly his concern that Acton wants to have knowledge and awareness of how Nagog Pond is being utilized. The annual report provides a high level check on Concord's stewardship of the resource without impermissibly creating a complex apparatus that gives a zoning authority the ability to micromanage the operations of a critical municipal public water supply. Concord understands and accepts the obligation to construct and operate the water treatment plant in compliance with applicable laws but the version of section 338 regarding the protection of environment and natural resources in the original decision imposed operating restrictions on Concord which are preempted by Concord's Water Management Act registration. In addition, Concord's position is that this condition is an attempt to regulate Concord's withdrawals. As discussed earlier, the issue of Concord's withdrawals is not before the board and the conditions in the original decision were arbitrary when compared with the board's actions on the 1994 special permit invariance. In terms of the potential impact on the environment from the construction and operation of the water treatment facility, nothing has changed in terms of Concord's withdrawal rights and the professional public water supply operational management since the board approved the ozone treatment facility in 94. The specific assertion that Concord's withdrawal from Nagog Pond must be regulated to understand the potential impact on recharge of Acton Water District's Conant Wells was squarely addressed in the testimony of Matt Mosteller, the environmental manager of the Acton Water District at the November 20th, 2017 remand hearing. In his presentation, Mr. Mosteller described the porosity of soils in the area around the Conant 1 and Conant 2 wells and explained how, given the nature of the soils in the area, there's no significant hydrologic connection between Nagog Pond and the Conant Wells due to the intervening, non-porous, non-permeable soils. Hence, 
According to the public water supply professional from the Acton Water District, the primary justification for the monitoring, which was given to protect Acton's groundwater resources, is not warranted. The proposed edits in the draft modified special permit decision preserve protections for Acton and Nagog Pond under the appropriate legal authorities, including the Water Management Act. With respect to the regulation of drinking water, Mass DEP is the controlling governmental authority, not a local zoning board. Under General Laws Chapter 111, Section 160, Mass DEP was authorized to make rules and regulations to protect public drinking water supply, so as to ensure the delivery of fit and pure water to all consumers. To implement this statutory authority, Mass DEP adopted health-based regulations which combined monitoring for contaminants in the water as well as treatment and watershed protection. These regulations are found at 310 CMR 22. Concord's express reservation of rights in the proposed language in section 338 is intended to preserve Concord's argument that if in the future Acton asserts that Concord's operation of Nagog Pond is being conducted in a manner that does not appropriately prevent significant damage to the environment in or adjacent to Nagog Pond, Concord can assert that its actions are protected from any enforcement by Acton if Concord is complying with the state regulations for public drinking water facilities. On the issue of protecting the environment and natural resources, it must be acknowledged that Concord has been a good steward of the pond and the 100 acres of land around Nagog Pond under Concord's control. Concord takes its stewardship role very seriously and will continue that role going forward. One positive outward sign of Concord's stewardship is the presence of bald eagles at Nagog Pond. The image we have is the uh, identified nesting area where bald eagles have been found and the distance to Concord's proposed treatment facility. This issue was raised in November 2017, but since that decision was not adopted, the board should consider once again that Concord agreed to add a new condition in section uh, 33118 regarding the nesting bald eagles that were identified after the original decision issued. Even in the absence of a formal condition, Concord has been observing all state and federal regulations regarding the eagles and will continue to monitor their nesting habits. As part of the construction monitoring equipment in the revised section 33118, Concord agreed to undertake reasonable efforts to avoid disturbance of nesting bald eagles as provided in the National Bald Eagle Management Guidelines. In addition, the modified special permit also directs Concord to follow direct guidance from the U.S. Department of Fish and Wildlife and the Massachusetts Division of Fisheries and Wildlife. In section 339 of the original decision, the board impermissibly imposed obligations on Concord regarding long-term multi-district planning and impermissibly asserted that the board could impose a legal obligation on Concord to provide water to properties along Route 2A in Acton in the context of a special permit proceeding without any other legal authority. Concord has been providing water to a section of Acton along Route 2A for decades and at, Acton's insist and at Acton's insistence agreed to negotiate an intermunicipal water supply agreement and submit that agreement to Acton Town Meeting. After concluding the negotiations on the IMA and having the select boards of both towns adopt the terms of the IMA, Acton Town Meeting voted down the IMA at the town meeting on April 3rd. For the purposes of this special permit proceeding, it is understood that the provision of water on Route 2A was not a proper exercise of the zoning authority and will not be the subject of further conditions and the modified special permit. With respect to planning between the towns, Concord has always maintained an openness towards working with the Acton Water District. Both towns participate in WARN, the Water Agency Response Network, and have a good collegial relationship. Recent examples of this include a, an incident in August 2010 when Chris Allen of the Acton Water District asked Concord to help respond to a potential water supply emergency involving a water main break on Laws Book Road. 
Though that emergency was eventually averted, the water suppliers were in direct communication and they were able to address the situation constructively. Similarly, the water supply professionals have had exchanges regarding Acton Water District's concern about the potential for contaminants reaching its wells and the possibility of working with Concord to address supply issues. These exchanges are typical and they occur without the formal obligation to confer as stated in the modified special permit. The towns rely on each other and coordinate their concerns in a respectful manner. The compromise language in the modified special permit anticipates that there will be further discussions among the towns and their public water suppliers, but the conditions are respectful. They're not tied to draconian and unneighborly enforcement measures. Again, as Concord stressed throughout this process, having the Nagog Pond water treatment plant permitted, constructed, and online will only improve Concord's ability to provide assistance during water emergencies and address potential water supply needs. In addition to sections 337, 338, and 339 that touch on Concord's water withdrawals, there were other conditions from the original permit that were modified in the draft special permit decision from November 2017. Concord is asking the board to reconsider these changes as part of the modified special permit decision. Some of these include the language in 3345 with respect to underwater archaeology. Again, as part of its appeal, Concord challenged the provisions in 334 that required it to provide open access to the exposed pond bottom. Concord was concerned about insurance risk, wetland resource management issues, and project delays. Concord noted that the Board of Underwater Archaeological Resources issued a letter dated November 13, 2015, which indicated a low likelihood that Concord would encounter archaeological resources during a portion of the project that involved work in Nagod Pond. Specifically, the BUAR stated that it, quote, expects that this project is unlikely to impact submerged cultural resources. Given the findings of the BUAR, Concord argued that the measures in the original special permit were not based on the evidence in the record and imposed an untenable obligation on Concord. Concord agreed to the modification of the condition on archaeological resources and to have PAL, P-A-L, its archaeological consultant, perform monthly site visits. Concord also agreed that during construction, its resident inspector will directly observe those aspects of the intake pipe replacement work that involve an excavation or disturb the pond bottom. In addition to these changes, Concord also agreed to express, the, to accept, express language that its work may be the subject of Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act of 1996. With respect to Section 337 on fence installation, monitoring, and reporting, there are some minor revisions to this section, but the thrust of it is that Concord will participate in good faith discussions among Concord, the Acton Natural Resources Department, and the Acton Land Stewardship Committee to consider the use of certain designated trails on Concord's land by pedestrians. In the text of the draft modified special permit decision, Concord acknowledged that the discussions regarding trails may consider connectivity to Breezy Point and the Nagog Hill Conservation Land. And Acton acknowledged that Concord retained the right and ability to exercise its discretion to assure a safe and clean public water supply, which may require restrictions on public access to its lands at Nagog Pond, including, but not limited to, prohibiting such public access. Concord supports this approach to address the interest of site security and working with public officials in Acton to provide some access to designated trails. With respect to section 336 on chemical deliveries, <coughs> Concord, <coughs> excuse me, Concord objected to the conditions in section 336 because they were arbitrary and attempted to impose obligations on Concord that the board had not included in other special permits and were not supported by evidence in the record. In particular, Concord argued that this condition was arbitrary because the Acton Water District has many of the same chemicals delivered by the same contractors to its facilities within Acton without conditions the board imposed on Concord. Despite its strong objections, Concord agreed to accept a requirement in the modified special permit to inform its vendors about the specific conditions imposed by the board 
by providing notice of the hour and days when deliveries are permitted, and by including language in its vendor contracts regarding their need to obey all applicable laws related to public and private roadways that they utilize while making deliveries to the water treatment facility. And with respect to section 3311 on the construction period, this section has some minor modifications that focus on remedial measures for activities attributable to Concord during the construction period. As part of the modified special permit, Concord agreed to accept the board's request for an independent construction monitor, and the, these modifications include express provisions for how Concord will finance that position. In conclusion, the draft modified special permit for the Nagog Pond Water Treatment Facility meets the requirements of sections 347 and 104 of the Acton Zoning Bylaw for a use special permit and a site plan special permit. Indeed, the Acton Planning Department submitted formal comments declaring that the modified special permit decision, quote, reasonably and, quote, robustly complies with the special permit siting criteria, including consistency with the master plan. The Planning Department's opinion provides additional support that the modified special permit is appropriate and consistent with the requirements of Acton Zoning Bylaw. With the proposed revisions, the modified special permit does not improperly infringe on Concord's rights to withdraw water from Nagog Pond and does not impose other obligations which exceed the authority of the board under the Zoning Act and the Act and Zoning Bylaw. Accordingly, the Town of Concord requests that the board issue the modified special permit. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Are there any questions from members of the Board of Selectmen? Okay, so with that, I will open this up to public comment. Um, and again, uh, we will start with a presentation by Carolyn Kiley, Bob Sekuler, Barry Elkin, and Kim Castens. And by previous arrangement, I've allowed them up to 45 minutes for this. Um, after that, I will open this up to comments from any members of the public. And just to reiterate again, um, I'm asking that the comments or the comments for this should be limited to changes um, made since the 2017, the March 2017 decision. Um, and I'm asking that comments be kept to two minutes and that you raise new points, not just reiterating comments that have already been made and that we will allow no interruptions. Thank you. So Kim, you may start. Um, slide, slideshow? Yeah, from the beginning. Beautiful. Good evening, I'm Kim Castens from 294 Pope Road, um, and I'm the first of these three coordinated talks. Um, so I'm sorry to say I had to add an extra slide to my presentation at the last minute. Um, so I, was, um, I had my talk all ready to go, and I looked in the DocuShare, and I found that Concord's lawyers had made a major new submission that, um, among other things, um, spent three pages plus one appendix on the proposition that Kim Kasten's public comments in opposition to the project are disingenuous and do not justify disapproval of the modified special permit. So um, disingenuous, this is not a word I actually use very much, so I looked it up to see what I was being accused of. And it's actually quite a nasty word. Um, the synonyms include dishonest, untruthful, false, deceitful, duplicitous, lying, mendacious. So this is pretty serious stuff. So I believe now, Acton Board of Selectmen, that your job for tonight involves figuring out who has been disingenuous, mis duplicitous, duplic duplicitous, mendacious in the set of hearings and associated documents. And as you puzzle over who to believe and who to doubt, remember that I am on the same side as you. I am doing the best that I can to the best of my ability to look after the interests of Acton and Acton's waters and Acton's ecosystems. And the people who prepared this document are not. They are doing what they're getting paid to do, which is to look after someone else's interests, Acton's interests. So. Okay, there's a lot of things I don't like about this document, but I'm not gonna take time to detail them all. I'm just gonna focus on this last um, attachment E. I think it was a really low blow to bring into this controversy the forum at Concord First Parish. This was like a really lovely event. It was in Concord, it was organized by Concord people who value the environment, who value um, civic discourse around difficult 
issues. The sanctuary was full, almost full, and people from Concord and Acton and Littleton and surrounding towns were all there talking in a deep and serious and meaningful way about water, changing, exchanging ideas, exchanging information. We need more events like this. So it's odd that it was in this packet. I mean, it's an odd accusation to level against an event at a Unitarian Universalist church. And I think the reason it was in there is because it was said that people were trying to stoke a water war. So, you know, we Unitarian Universalists, we don't start wars, water wars or any other kind of wars. So this event was about seeking ways to prevent a future here in Massachusetts, which is rife with the kind of water wars that have bedeviled other places, places that have less water. So, okay, let me go back to my prepared comments. Um, so, um, uh, why are we talking about water? We're talking about water because the site plan, plan special permit and um, the special permit for other public use both require that the applicant's plan be consistent with Acton's master plan, Acton 2020. Acton 2020, in turn, requires the protection of the quality and quantity of Acton's water. Um, so last spring, the Board of Selectmen labored long and hard to draft a set of terms and conditions that would allow Concord to build their water treatment plant, but would also protect the quality and quantity of Acton's waters. So one protection was that Concord must operate its facility and manage its withdrawal so as to preserve and protect the water and environment near, in and near Nagog Pond and Nagog Brook and avoid adverse impacts to Acton's groundwater resources. Ms. Kiley will talk about what has happened to this provision. I'm going to talk about another provision, the original um, monitoring program, which said that Concord shall develop a reasonably tailored monitoring and reporting program with the objective of enabling the various stakeholders to better understand the relationships between um, flows and pond levels in the pond, the brook, and the Conet wells. And there was to be a baseline data collection component. This was quite a flexible set of um, requirements with room for negotiation, but it was non-negotiable that there had to be data collected, that data had to be shared, and there had to be a baseline data collection. So that is completely gone. Instead, we find this new section called withdrawal reporting that says Concord shall provide a copy of its individual surface water source statistics um, at the same time it sends it into the state. So this is a, like a non-offer. There's nothing to this. This is public domain data. So I thought it was public domain data. I wasn't sure. I did a little experiment. I wrote to Nasty EP asking for five years worth of data for all three towns. I wrote late on a Friday afternoon. The answer came right back. They're readily available and I can forward to, the, to them on Monday. So Monday, 15 fat PDFs land in my inbox, all five years, all three towns. There's nothing here. There's, you know, to, to call this a concession, to say that this is a good faith effort um, to give information of value to Acton, it's no big deal. It's, it's a, there's nothing there. Um, however, um, I really, so this is basically, look, I opened up these things and what you find is that this is the year 2016, this is for Concord Source of Nagog Pond, and over here, month by month, to the third decimal place, broken down by month, is um, Indri, the withdrawal data. It's all there, it's all public domain, there's nothing to this offer. Um, however, I really like data, so I plotted up the data to see what I could learn once I had it. Um, so the, in this graph, the horizontal axis is time for five years from January 2012 to December 2016. Each vertical bar represents one month, and the earth-colored parts of the bar represent withdrawals from Concord's um, six groundwater wells. The blue represents withdrawals from Concord's sole surface water source, Nagog Pond, and the vertical axis is millions of gallons of water withdrawn from that source during that month. And so there's a couple interesting things you can see. First is that the summer withdrawals are much higher than the winter withdrawals, much more so than in Acton. Concord has not been nearly as proactive as Acton at limiting summertime withdrawals. And secondly, the NAGOG withdrawals have only been in the summertime and they've been quite small. It's misleading to say that nothing's gonna change um, because a lot will change. The withdrawals will go from very small to very large. Okay, so, um, so I would like now to, well, well, I really hope you guys vote no tonight. 
But it's not enough to vote no. You have to have something positive to fight for. It's not enough to just vote no to a bad deal. You need something to work towards, something to fight for, and that's what I'm going to talk about now. So a deal worth fighting for would be a win-win-win for the three towns that have legal rights to waters from Nagog Pond under the Acts of 1884, Acton, Concord, and Littleton. A, um, a good outcome would protect the ecosystems of Nagog Pond and Nagog Brook and the downstream aquifer. So how could we get there? Well, um, I've been thinking a lot about this. And in fact, that forum that at Concord First Parish was a very important um, pro part of this process of me thinking about where do we want to end up? What would be good? Like not just rejecting what would be bad, but, but figuring out what would be good. So I think I've got four parts to this idea. One is uh, scale the capacity of the water treatment facility to the size of the pond. Secondly, develop a reservoir man management plan that would protect the ecosystems and the aquifer. Third, monitor and monitor model um, the surface and groundwater levels and flows so that you guys in the future can make evidence-based decisions. And then finally, develop and administer the treatment plant as a regional facility. So let's take these one by one. Scale the capacity of the water treatment plant to the size of the pond. There's a reason this is called Nagog Pond rather than Nagog Lake. It's a very small body of water and it's in a really small watershed. The USGS study of the firm yield of the reservoirs across Massachusetts found that Nagog Pond could support a withdrawal rate of 0.86. You've seen this graph before, so I won't belabor it. Whereas the capacity of the plant treatment plant is 1.5 million gallons per day. Um, higher than that, the reservoir would fail in a severe drought. I heard and I understood Concord's point that 1.5 million gallons per day is a peak capacity which would be exercised at times of greatest need, not every day all year round. However, we saw from the graph a moment ago that Concord's time of greatest need is in the summer. That's when their greatest withdrawals have occurred year after year after year. Um, in the summer is when the pond and the brook ecosystems are most stressed. So it is not reassuring at all to think about them using their plant at its full capacity at the time of their greatest need in the summer. I also heard Mr. Cathcart's promise back in November when he told us that of course the Concord Water Department would be good stewards of their reservoir and would not draw down the pond all the way to reservoir failure. But I see that the plant has been designed with the capacity to draw down the reservoir. And I see no checks and balances other than Mr. Cathcart's verbal promise that this will not happen. So that brings me to my second point, which is to develop a reservoir management plan that would protect the ecosystem of Nagog Pond and Nagog Brook and the downstream aquifer. So there's a lot of elements to this. If you look on the Green Acton website, you'll see many tools in the um, reservoir management toolbox that might be brought into play. But I'm just going to talk about a relatively simple, straightforward one, which is the, to um, limit the, um, the place a limit on, the, on how far down the pond level can be drawn before water withdrawals have to be curtailed. So this is a history of the pond um, level from 1912 over here to 2016. The vertical axis is elevation above sea level. So this is the spillway, right, where all the data stops. Um, and then there have been many occasions when the pond has been drawn down two or three feet. Um, so the scale is funny, but this is five feet from here to here. So it's been down, drawn down two or three feet many, many times. It's been drawn down um, approximately five feet once and about seven or eight feet once. Um, the current plan, however, has the capacity to pull down the pond to as much as 25 feet below the level of the spillway. What we're looking at here is a not very good reproduction of um, one of the engineering drawings, sheet C6, if you're following along at home. Um, uh, and it says in the text that the existing pipe will be 1,800 feet long. So I measured on that engineering drawing, and 1,800 feet is the blue part here. This red part is longer. It's not just being replaced, it's being extended. 
Um, so the engineering drawings um, on a different sheet show there's two openings, and the lower water intake is at 200.7 and 200 feet elevation, which is 25 feet below the spillway. Um, so this is a map of Nagag Pond. The outermost ring is the current shoreline. The little green, blue part in the middle shows um, where the pond would be left if the pond were drawn down to the level of the proposed lower intake. So Concord has told us they won't do this. In the latest Mackie Shea packet, page 10, says, that is absurd to imagine that Concord as stewards of this water supply would draw down Nagog Pond to the level of the intake pipe. So fine, if this is truly astounding that they would consider doing this, that this is something they would never do, then it should be no big deal to write down that promise in a formal document and sign for both towns that that's, you know, that that's a commitment. Acting Board of Selectmen, you should insist on this and willingly agree. As to exactly what the threshold level should be, I think that should be worked out and I think most people would agree that 25 feet is too much. So I want to add one more point that wasn't in my written comments, but back here, um, it's really um, significant that this lower water intake is a lot deeper than the previous intake. And I bring that up, I'm detouring to that topic because of um, Mr. During's comments about um, the insistence that, that this is under the Water Management Act registration regime. Because um, in the uh, Mass DEP response to the environmental impact report, which is conveniently included as Appendix A in this week's Mackie Shea document um, on page uh, three. It says, if the town intends to install the new water intake at a lower depth than the old intake, then it will need to obtain an amendment to its water withdrawal permit. In other words, the lower intake pushes this into the permit regime, not into the registration regime. Okay, back to where I was going. Back to the thinking about the good impact, it, a good outcome. What would a good outcome look like? So monitor and model surface and groundwater levels and flows to support evidence-based decision making. So there's a lot of different kinds of data that one could imagine um, would be useful. I'm just going to show two examples as an, uh, to, to illustrate the kinds of things that you could do if you had good data. Um, so since um, last summer, um, we, the um, Green Acton, with technical assistance from ORS, has been collecting water depth data at Nagog Pond. And um, the horizontal axis is time from July of 2017 to April of this year. And the vertical axis is water depth. So this is a measure of how much water is flowing through the stream. And what we see is a, um, a summer fall low flow regime a transition period in here, and then a winter-spring high-flow regime. This is very typical of Massachusetts um, streams, and fisheries are particularly vulnerable during the low-flow summer regime. We've also been collecting temperature data, so same horizontal axis of time from July last year to April of this year. At this time, the vertical axis is temperature in degrees Celsius. Um, so we have warm water in the summer, then a transitional period. During the winter, the water is just above freezing, and now we're in spring, and it's coming back up again. For reference, 20 degrees Celsius is the cold water fishery standard in Massachusetts. The water gets above that level, is no longer, even for a very short period of time, no longer safe for fish. So in the current regime of small withdrawals from Nagog Pond, um, the fishery is, the, the brook is staying below this threshold, but just barely. There's not a lot of um, leeway. Okay, the final element of this vision is to develop and administer the Nagog treatment plant as a regional facility. Under laws going back to colonial times, a great pond like Nagog Pond belongs by default to the people of the Commonwealth, unless the legislature says otherwise. In the Acts of 1884, the legislature gave legal rights to Nagog Pond to three towns, Concord, Acton and Littleton. Developing a treatment plant that would serve the peoples of all three towns would be complicated. There'd be lots to be initiated. I understand this doesn't all fit in a zoning um, consideration, but you've now set the example of how one can take things out of the zoning con consideration and put them into an intermunicipal agreement. If you want to do this, you can find a way to do it. Um, and, you know, in Massachusetts, we've found ways to to collaborate across towns on complicated enterprises. Schools, for example. Is it really harder to plan and collaboratively administer a water treatment plant than a high school? Probably not. 
Okay, so Board of Selectmen, you're likely to be thinking, you know, this is really hopeless, she is so unrealistic, Concord would never agree to such a win-win-win plan. They're holding out for winner takes all. So, like, maybe the gentlemen in this room are holding out for winner takes all, but I think the people of Concord could be attracted to such a plan. Concord people value their worldwide reputation as an environmentally forward-looking town the home of Walden Pond, the home of Henry David Thoreau. In 2011, their Board of Selectmen adopted a set of sustainability principles, which include reduce encroachment upon nature and meet human needs fairly and efficiently. So I think the people who wrote these principles and the town that adopted them and the people who came to the forum at First Parish in Concord um, would, would be open to such an approach. So try it. Board of Selectmen. On the other hand, if it doesn't work, if Concord won't in fact play nicely with the neighbors, then turn your backs on them and see what kind of a deal you can work out with Littleton. Okay, Carolyn. Excuse me, I've asked that you not applaud or make any other disruptions, and then we will ask everybody to leave if this continued. Oh my goodness gracious. Um, my name is Carolyn Kiley, and I live at 11 Parkland Lane in Acton. And as you know, in, in, as well as with uh, Dr. Kastens and Robert Cooler and Barry Elkin, we've been uh, intimately involved in the opposition public comments on the uh, water treatment plant. And I have to send the regrets from Barry Elkin. Um, he is un unfortunately injured and is stuck at home and relegated to watching this on TV. Um, so we, we hope you get better bear, fast, Barry. You've been awesome to work with. Um, you've already heard um, about the absolutely useless water reporting provisions that Concord made you think was useful. Um, we've also heard a framework from Dr. Kastens about moving forward for all three towns, Acton, Concord, and Littleton, that will be a truly positive outcome to this situation. I'm here to discuss what's going on in Littleton, because that's directly relevant. The very few disappointing additional changes made in the revised draft modified permit. I'm going to talk about moving forward. And I'm going to talk about the wonderful implications to Acton of Concord's urging tonight through Mr. Durning that you can only consider this as a zoning hearing. To use Mr. Durning's own words in his opening statement, he said that this is, quote, a hearing to consider whether citing a water treatment plant on this property is appropriate under the zoning bylaws. This is wonderful. Concord isn't asking you to look at using Nagog Pond in the future. All Mr. Durning has asked is if the land is appropriate for a water treatment plant. I'll elaborate later on this and the great implications of the limited scope of this hearing as requested by Concord later in my testimony. What's Littleton doing now? In October of 2017, Littleton asked to meet with Acton's water district and or the selectmen to, quote, agree on a water allocation protocol that would be applicable to withdrawals from Nagog Pond. Unfortunately, no meeting occurred, not even an exploratory meeting to find out what Littleton was thinking. Then in February, February 20th to be exact, 2018, Littleton sent a letter to Concord stating that Littleton will apply, not may, they will apply to the state's Supreme Judicial Court to exercise, quote, the full extent of the rights conferred under the 1884 Act to withdraw water from Nagog Pond. Then, when Concord never replied to the February 20th letter from Littleton, uh, just last week, April 17th, Littleton sent a letter to Concord saying that Littleton will petition the Supreme Judicial Court, the highest court in the state of Massachusetts, on May 1st to exercise Littleton's rights under the 1884 law. And in its April 2018 newsletter to Littleton residents, the Littleton Electric Light and Water Departments effectively asserted to all Littleton residents that Littleton was acting on its rights to Nagog Pond. 
The newsletter states that Littleton is, quote, asserting its rights to withdraw water from Magog Pond, end quote. So Littleton's actions have been communicated to the community at large within Littleton. This is no longer just a transmittal of letters. This is a public assertion that Littleton will be taking water from Nagog Pond. The result? Littleton and Acton both have priority rights under the law to Nagog Pond. Littleton at first, in October, thought, sought to share with Acton the priority water rights to Nagog. Now that Acton hasn't met with Littleton, Littleton is going forward by itself to the state's highest court for affirmation of its rights to priority water withdrawal. With issuance of this permit, if it's issued, and I hope it's not, actively is effectively placed in third position to water at Magog Pond. Now I'm going to talk about the changes made in the revised permit and why they're disappointing. Um, as you heard, changes were made to the environmental protection provisions that are reflected in the new section 3.3.8. This section, while appearing to be helpful, totally undermines the original environmental mandate that you, the Act and Selectman, gave Concord. Your initial permit told Concord that they, quote, shall operate its facility and manage its withdrawals from Nagog Pond in a manner that one, appropriately preserves and protects the water and environment in and near Nagog Pond and Nagog Brook. And number two, avoids adverse, Im excuse me, avoids adverse impacts to Acton's groundwater resources. So you are protecting the land near Nagog Pond, not adjacent near, you are protecting Nagog Brook and the groundwater. How has this been changed? It's been changed not how it was described by council. What it says now is that Concord only has to prevent significant damage to the environment, quote, in and adjacent to Nagog Pond. And significant should be in quotes too. They can't, why, well, let me just calm down here. <laughs> First of all, why can Concord now make any degradation as long as it doesn't amount to significant degradation. That's a total retraction from your original standard of preservation and protection. Before, they couldn't damage things. Now, as long as it's not significant, they can go ahead. Second, deleted is the requirement to protect non-immediately adjacent areas. They don't have to protect the brook anymore and they don't have to protect our groundwater resources. In short, you've given up the farm with this new provision. But you do say that Concord must construct and operate the facility in compliance with existing and future state and federal laws. But if Concord made you believe that that's all they need to do, and it will encompass what you originally required, then they swindled you. Additionally, as, as we were told tonight by our council, this language now allows Concord to become totally exempt from this provision as long as they claim at a later date that this language, and I'm gonna quote from the permit that we're discussing tonight, shall, as long as they claim that this language, quote, shall not be interpreted as a waiver of any challenge that Concord may have to the validity or enforceability of this clause. So Concord is telling Acton that, one, they will abide by state and federal laws, two, as long as it means that they can build and operate their facility the way they want. If this clause requires Concord to not significantly damage the pond or immediately adjacent areas interferes with Concord's plant operation, they can claim that this clause doesn't apply to them. Why are we agreeing to this? Why did we retreat from the original permit language? Why can they degrade the environment as long as it's not significant degradation? I have no idea. 
but this is a bad clause for Acton, our environment, and our water resources. Can I get a drink of water? Acton water. Oh, yeah. It'll calm me down. Number two, the latest iteration of the permit in clause 3.3.9, it now expressly excludes Route 2A water supply from the talks that will, quote unquote, periodically occur between Acton and Concord on, quote, water supply coordination and planning, end quote. The original permit included Route 2A in these mandatory periodic talks. There is no reason that water supply along Route 2A should be excluded from a discussion on water supply coordination and planning, especially when another clause, Clause 2.21, states that Acton's selectman, and I quote, expects that Concord will provide full existing, new, and expanded water service to all properties along Great Road and Acton, end quote. If Acton selectmen expect Concord to provide continued and expanded water service along Route 2A, why would you expressly delete Route 2A from the discussions on water supply and planning? It makes no sense. The original language of this proposed permit must be in the language that you vote on tonight. The language I'm moving on to another topic. The language regarding trails through Concord's land appears to have been beefed up, but that's not a guarantee that any trails through Concord land will actually ever be allowed. The new section 3.3.10 requires Concord to, quote, engage in good faith discussions, end quote, with town boards only regarding the establishment of trails through Concord's properties. Blocked out of the conversation are the residents of abutting communities to these talks, and these are the true stakeholders and users of the existing pathways over Concord's lands. And despite the discussions with town boards, this clause still allows Concord to block public access through the lands that they own along Nagog Pond, and that is unacceptable. And other than these provisions, this is essentially, uh, excuse me, other than these unacceptable provisions, this is essentially the same permit that you, the selectmen, voted upon unsuccessfully in November. And it remains as unpalatable to us, the residents, as before. In terms of moving forward, you've already heard about a positive approach to moving forward by Dr. Kim Castens, and that's what I'm supporting. Give Acton, Concord, and Littleton equal access to Nagak Pond. And as an olive branch, Concord should offer to move its plant to its land that they own at the Concord Ele Electric Light District, which borders Route 2A, and where Concord already has two-way pipes up and down Nagak Pond. However, if such a regional solution, which is the right solution and all of us know it, cannot be agreed upon, and assuming that you, our selectmen, issue Concord its per permit tonight, there are a few things that must be made known. Number one, and Barry Elkin did a lot of work on this, so um, if he was here tonight, he'd be helping out on this. So far, Concord's pretty much followed the laws of 1884. I don't like how they took Acton's waterfront from Nagog Pond by eminent domain in 1909, but. That was in 1909, and we let him do it. But once Concord issues its town meeting approved bond for this project, Concord will have violated the Acts of 1884 and the Law of 1904. The Acts of 1884 in Section 8 states clearly that Concord is limiting to, limited to bonding or borrowing, quote, an amount not exceeding $50,000, end quote. And the acts of 1909, that amount is increased to not exceeding $100,000. So when converted to today's dollars, an authorization to borrow $100,000, let's use the larger amount, 
That means the conqueror today can borrow or bond $2.7 million. So let Concord issue its bond for $13 million. It's a clear violation of the law. And there is no severability clause in the Acts of 1884. A severability clause says that if any part of the law is declared invalid, the rest of the law remains in force. But there isn't one in, in this act. So when Concord violates the Acts of 1884 by bonding above their legal bond limit, they have violated the 1884 law, and there is nothing to prevent a judge from ruling that the entire law is invalid. So I am cautioning Concord to follow the 1884 law, or you may not have any right. Your right to use Nagak Pond could be in jeopardy. And we as residents will also closely be watching the wording on risk in Concord's actual bond issuance. We have specialists in federal securities laws among our ranks who will be looking closely at any actual bond language separate and apart from the violation of the maximum amount that can be bonded. Now, the Act and Water Commissioners, at its meeting on April 9th, agreed that the, quote, sense of the town, end quote, was that it is time to go to the legislature and access their rights under the 1884 law. I'm going to quote from the minutes of the AWD Commissioner's April 9th meeting. The minutes state, quote, it's time to get serious about going to the legislature and getting a clarification of the Acts of 1884. He mentioned that Littleton is headed in that direction. Not sure what the Acton Board of Selectmen will do, but would like to see the district support that effort, end quote. So the train has already left the station. No matter what you, the Selectmen, do tonight, the water commissioners have singled, signaled that it's time to move forward with seeking to get water from Nagog Pond in the future. Congratulations, water commissioners. And I can submit a copy of their minutes for the record if you want them. I've got them over here. Um, we've already talked about Littleton being serious about their efforts to access Nagog Pond. And we as residents are not at the end of the road with regard to challenging Concord's efforts to site this water treatment plant at Nagog Pond because Concord must still obtain state and federal permits for this project. And we as residents will be monitoring these permit applications and commenting to them about them throughout the process. And we'll also be commenting through on Concord's renewal for its Water Management Act permit, which should begin by the last quarter of 2018. And, and in that, we'll be focusing, among other things, on the safe yield, the USGS safe yield report, which Dr. Kastens um, presented, which shows that the safe yield is way below what Concord is seeking to withdraw on its permit. Now, what was stressed tonight, what our council started with, and what Mr. Durning collaborated with, is that this is a zoning hearing where you, by approve, where you are approving a building under Act and Zoning Bylaws. Um, Mr. Durning tonight stated that you are considering whether a water treatment plant is appropriate for this site. He expressly said that he doesn't want you to consider anything else such as water withdrawals. Therefore, you are not agreeing to do anything other than permit a building and have been told so by the two councils here. So remember, this is awesome. You have not agreed to forego Nagog Pond at all. By Concord asking that all you're doing, or stating that all you're doing is permitting a building, you are now free of any binds against you, and you can now look at doing what is in the best interest of Acton. I urge you, therefore, to begin immediately talking with Littleton about ways to ensure priority rights to Nagot Pond. You were told during the public comment period of this past Monday's Board of Selectmen meeting that the door is still open for Acton to work with Littleton on accessing Nagot Pond. Once this permit is issued, and I strongly urge you not to issue it, but once it's issued, your obligations to Concord are complete. You've conducted a zoning hearing, and you've decided whether or not this building can be on this property. That's all Mr. Durning asked you to do tonight, and he didn't, and he specifically said, don't consider water withdrawals or anything else. So I urge you to arrange to talk to Littleton as quickly as possible and to move forward like the Acton Water District Commissioners has agreed to do 
Um, so classifying this as a building permit is beautiful. Use it to your advantage and to the advantage of the town of Acton. Um, I also want to announce tonight briefly that I'm going to launch my candidacy for the next open position of the Water District Commissioners. I want to support them in moving forward uh, with Nagat Pond. Now, where do I, I'm sorry. I'm very emotional about this if you haven't figured this out. Seven. So I've lost my place. I apologize. Nine, 11. Okay, act in selectment. Sorry about this. You have the opportunity tonight to send a strong signal that you're supportive of Acton and its rights, and you can signal support for a regional solution. How to do this? By denying this permit. The changes in the draft weaken the permit even further from the permit that was not approved in November. Deny this permit and require Concord to make concessions, actual concessions, that protect Acton residents, the environment, the wildlife, and the groundwater supply and signal the need to move, to move forward with a regional solution, and as I've already recommended, start working with Littleton. In Concord, please consider your proposed financial investment in this facility and look for ways to, your, to make your investment worthwhile for the citizens of Concord. Right now, legally and legislatively, you are third in line for water to Nagog Pond. An issuance of this permit to you as even you have stated is merely a permit for a building, does nothing to change that. We will be looking over your shoulder every step of the way from this point forward. To conclude, Act and Selectman, please vote no on this, this. And if you do issue a permit for this building, then immediately begin working with Littleton to access our priority water rights. Thank you. Bob, you go. I'm Robert Sekuler. I live on Parkland Lane in Acton. Uh, any vote you take tonight on April 26, 2018, 2018 will affect Acton not only on April 26, 2019, but on April 26s for scores of years to come. In Charles Dickens' story, A Christmas Carol, Ebenezer Scrooge got a preview of the future. That preview had a profound salutary effect on him. Mr. Scrooge saw his future and changed his ways. While I am definitely not the ghost of Christmas future, let me conjure up for you a vision, a possible vision of the future for Acton. My hope is that this preview of a possible future might have a salutary effect on members of the board. Imagine a future in which unwise development, climate change, increasing severe pollution of our groundwater wells and inaction by elected officials have all conspired to cast Acton into a profound continuing water emergency. While our neighbor Concord is doing just fine, thank you, well on its way to exhausting Nagog Pond and destroying the cold water fish resource that is Nagog Brook. Seeing this state of affairs, a town historian would wonder how all this came to pass. Consulting the voluminous record of your hearings and the videotapes of those hearings, she would conclude that elected officials were cautioned again and again about the threat, but failed to take action to protect our town. What are some of the things that the town historian would unearth in the records and the videotapes? First, she would discover that Acton's, ele that Acton's elected officials bought Concord's disingenuous, there's that word, assertion that it was merely replacing a pipe that had been in place for 100 years. Seems harmless, seems sensible, but the engineering drawings that Kim Kastens, Dr. Kastens, showed you indicates that Concord's plan is not as benign as you have been led to believe. It is a substantially longer pipe extending not only further out into the, into the pond, but also, and I think this is even worse, far deeper into the pond. It's like taking a straw and going from just sipping from the top of a glass of water with that straw to going all the way to the bottom of that straw. 
Concord could, with this deeper intake, Concord could draw water from the pond even though increasingly frequent droughts stressed the entire region's aquifer. And we've been told there's nothing we can do about it because the Water Management Act trumps all. Uh, Concord's replacing, uh, Concord's so-called replacement pipe is like a kid who owns a BB gun replacing it with an AR-15. Not exactly an even exchange. Acton officials could telephone, email, and message Concord officials to remind them of their promises, their assurances that be, they'd be good stewards of Nagar Pond water. But a permit that you issue with no written firm agreement on pond stewardship, other than to trust Act Concord to be, continue to be a good neighbor, uh, would have no consequence to protect Acton's water resources. Second, the town historian would find that Acton's elected officials allowed Concord to refuse inspection and monitoring of the Nagogs, both Pond and Brook, and the downstream uh, resources, namely Neshoba Brook. This would puzzle the town historian because she was familiar with President Reagan's famous dictum, trust but verify. She'd conclude that you, the board, forgot the verify part and gave all of your trust to Concord. That failure to insist on monitoring the impact on Acton's water resources is, in my view, unpardonable. Third, the town historian would be totally puzzled by the failure of uh, the Board of Selectmen to take action, to take, act to take Littleton up on its offer to partner with Acton in asserting our rights under the, under the Acts of 1884. We've given Littleton, for the moment, I hope it's gonna change, the intermunicipal equivalent of the cold shoulder. We have ignored the possibility that as a result, our town's initial superior historical de jure rights would be downgraded. Because of its inaction, we would, because of our inaction, Acton would drop down to third in line for Nagog water, and our, our historical rights were squandered. Fourth, the town historian would find that our elected officials bought Concord's disingenuous assertion that its new building would occupy, its new building would occupy the same footprint as the current building. She would compare the plans of the two buildings and recognize that it must be the case that in Concord, the term building permit, uh, footprint must not mean what the dictionary definition clearly uh, states that it does. Finally, the town historian would find Concord doing just fine using its Nagog water, in, in, particularly in the summertime, to support a massive new industrial park new McMansions, and ability to keep its lawns as rich green as any in a Scots Lawn commercial. At the same time, our town historian would see Acton struggling with crippling prolonged water shortages, and not only dur uh, during our increasingly hot summers, and find Acton unable to allow desirable new development and more affordable housing. We would be in a bind. After scouring the thousands of documents and watching hours of videotape from your hearings, the town historian in the future would be justified to shake her head in disbelief, disbelief and say to herself again and again and again, they were warned but chose not to listen. Thank you. Thank you, Kim, Carolyn, and Bob. Um, I'll now open it up to the general public, so if you just line up and state your name and the street that you live on. And again, um, please keep your comments to two minutes. Thank you. I don't have the uh, legal or technical background in this field, so sorry, I may be more say plain name? spoken. You... I'm sorry, my name is Ralph Lowry. I live at Skyline Drive in Acton. And I apologize if I will be more plain spoken about some of these issues than the, than the previous technical observations. Um, I've been involved with this for the past two years, two and a half years, 
and it has become very obvious to me over that period of time, and it should be obvious to you, and it should be obvious to every member of the, uh, of the town of Acton that Concord has had and continues to have the objective of obtaining exclusive and permanent rights to the water of Nagog Pond. They started this process in 1884, maybe inadvertently at that time, but nevertheless it proceeded along that line. It was extended with the uh, addition of the pumping station. It was extended further with the, uh, the construction of the ozone treatment plant. And now the step, which is almost the final step in this process of complete domination of the water rights to, to uh, Nagog, will be the, the construction of a filtration plant on the shore of, 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 the, of the pond. And I would say that um, this is what this recent non-binding article, was, which was discussed at the town meeting, which was solidly defeated, was all about. I quote that the article, the Board of Selectmen agrees that not to pursue during the agreement term any legislation, regulatory, or judicial actions that will constrain Concord's existing rights to withdraw water from Nagog Pond. Note that the, the article also includes the fact that Acton had previously approved a motion for the Board of Selectmen to petition the legislation, the legislature, to affirm Acton's right to draw water from Nag Nagog Pond, which has not been acted upon. I'll try to go through this more briefly, but the, 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 uh, the article, in my opinion, was a public relations exercise which by offering a non-binding proposal to provide a slight increase in water to the 2A corridor was encouraging some modest support from Acton and which would essentially prevent Acton from even mentioning further water uh, need from Nagar for 25 years or so. As you now see, since the article was defeated, Concord has withdrawn its non-binding offer. I'm not sure what the submission and subsequent retraction of a non-binding offer should be called, but to me it sounds like a scam. I'm sorry I have to say that, but it really had no meaning, had no benefit to the citizens of the town of Acton. It was purely supportive of, of Concord's position and allowed them to proceed without any kind of contention from the town of Acton. I, I think this, this permitting of this project at this point in time under the current proposal will put Concord at least 95% of the way towards achieving its ultimate objective of dominating the, and controlling the water supply of Nagar Pond. The, the formal and legal acknowledgement now, and I emphasize now, of Acton's future right to take Nagog water will be a contentious issue with the inevitable need for water by Acton occurs and when Concord goes to the courts or to the legislature to preserve what it would characterize as its presumed exclusive right, which they will have able uh, to be shown by their, by their own loan use over the past 130 or 40 years or so which will be a significant factor when that issue comes before any judge or jury or, or legislative uh, body. So, in my opinion, this, is, this, this project permitted under the, under the agreement that exists now it does nothing to, it is not, not beneficial to the town of Acton, and I believe it essentially gives up the right for Acton to have, may have in utilizing Nagarag water. We've already heard that Littleton is starting to get aroused. I'm, I'm not sure why they weren't involved more frequently with this issue from the very beginning. They should have been. So in my opinion, again, by permitting this project, the board is really saying that Acton will never, and I repeat never, will, will have a need for Nagog water. I do not have the confidence in that foresight. So instead of the wording in the defeated town meeting article, I strongly urge that the following should be included in any final permitting agreement. And I, I have written something which is not legally 
uh, solid, but you, you'll get the meaning of it as I go through. Mr. So Lillard, how much longer are your comments? I'm, I've got two paragraphs. Okay. Now, let, me, let me read this paragraph. There, I would suggest that this a paragraph be added somewhere into the language of the permitting process. The permitting of Conkin's water treatment plant will in no way cancel or limit Act, Acton or Littleton's existing rights to withdraw water from Nagog Pond at any time in the future. Upon notification by Acton and Littleton to all appropriate authorities, Carcott will not initiate any legislative, regulatory, or judicial action to con constrain Acton's or Littleton's right and will agree to proceed in a cooperative manner to permit exercise of those rights over a transition period of not more than 10 years or as mutually agreed upon by the parties. Uh, I, I, I believe without wording of this sort of the thing that it will be added to this article in this room 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now, there'll be a group of people sitting around here wondering why Acton does not have the right to withdraw water from a pond that's within its geographical boundaries. And I strongly urge you to reject this uh, proposal as it stands at the moment without the addition of some formal acknowledgement that Acton preserves the right that was uh, stated in the original act of 1884. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jim Snyder Grant, uh, 18 Half Moon Hill. Um, you guys look tired. Um, I was, you're in a really difficult position, and I get that. On the one hand, you have people who are talking to you about Here's a decision that you should treat very narrowly. It's a zoning decision, and it's, it hangs off the Water Management Act. And then you have a bunch of other people, including a lot of your fellow citizens, asking you to please looking at this broadly in terms of the you know, long-term needs of Acton and the long-term needs of the region. And those are really hard things to put together into the same decision. So I get that. Um, so what I see is that um, there are there are forces on the edges that are going to be helpful in that long-term goal of uh, protecting Acton's water rights and doing well by the region. And you've heard all of them tonight. You've heard about um, that the, uh, the, water management, um, the water management rights are up for review every 10 years, including this year for Concord, so things may change. You've heard that Littleton has gone ahead and uh, you know, gone to the Supreme Judicial Court to ask for water rights. Um, and you have an opportunity to either participate in that or not. Um, so there are things moving. So what does that mean about this, this narrow zoning decision? Here's, here's what I think, is that if you are, um, if you vote against this and you continue in court, you may win some, you may lose some. Uh, your current, the current permit as written is basically losing. So if you go to court, it takes longer each day that this project is delayed is another day for the uh, Dagog Brook to continue to run and have fish in it. Uh, and every day that this is not built uh, it gives the full attention of Concord to the issues of um, regional water use that might be bubbling up in the next year or two. So I'd urge you to vote no. Um, the Green Acton position is because the March 2018 draft modified special permit decision fails to protect the quantity and quality of Acton's water in clear opposition to the Acton 2020 Master Plan and the will of the citizenry, as expressed in the 2017 town meeting, Green Acton urges our Board of Selectmen to vote no on Concord's application to expand its water treatment capacity at Nagog Pond. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. My name is Tariq Pekin. I have been a resident of Acton for 39 years. Currently, I reside, reside at 53 Skyline Drive, which leads to the Nagog treatment plant. I am a registered professional engineer in Massachusetts, and I specialize in the planning and implementation of water and wastewater infrastructure, mostly internationally. I am speaking on behalf of myself, of course. Obviously, there is a deep divide between Concord and Acton on this project. On one side, Concord's goal is to maximize withdrawals from Nagog Pond, 
primarily for summer needs. On the other side, Acton citizens want to minimize projects' environmental impacts, which will be highest during summer, as it was explained. Some technical details. Concord is proposing a treatment plant with an installed capacity of 2.25 million gallons per day, including the standby units. That comes as a surprise to people. And it has a nominal average capacity of 1.5 million gallons per, per day, according to the design drawings. But Conquer's project information sheet submitted to the state as part of the draft, draft environment impact report also states the capacity as 0.75 MGD continuous. So there is a discrepancy there, and I am not sure what it means. But summary sheets in environmental impact assessments are important because that's how the project will be registered. This is all against the Nagopan firm yield of 0 0.86 million gallons per day based on hydrology and hydraulics only. Environmental protection considerations could lower this rate for all current and potential future users. There is a significant gap between the safe capacity of the pond and the proposed plant and potential future users. We know that Massachusetts DEP has already advised Concord that the permitting process will require consideration of water withdrawal minimization and mitigation of impacts on local stream flows and cold water fisheries. We also know that Town of Concord so far has not shown any interest. Residential water consumption in Concord should be in the order of 1.2 million gallons per day average, based on the mandated 65 residential gallons per day <coughs> per capita, with non-residential withdrawals added. Overall, overall, permitted withdrawal will be about 2.5 million gallons per day average. It is apparent that Concord sees the proposed Nago plant as its main source of water. Again, long-term impacts for the Nago pond subbasin has not been addressed. And I want to refer here that I'm referring to the Water Management Act parameters. So as a result of the state permitting process, the plant as proposed and may end up to be too large for the service conditions. The greater challenge to Concord may come from the state. This should be, it should also be a concern to Concord, technically and financially, if not environmentally. It is very unfortunate that these hearings are being held under the shadow of litigation. This has made the divide deeper and wider. Lines of communication have been broken for most stakeholders. Littleton is one important example. But litigation begets litigation. There is no reason why some other stakeholder could not enter litigation at some point. Hopefully this will not be necessary. That's what I wrote last night, but now I'm hearing that it's the clouds are, storm clouds are gathering. Uh, I do hope that uh, the board will postpone any decision. I'm not saying reject it. As an engineer, I am trained to make projects work, not to reject them. But there is so much, so much work that needs to be to understand that project. There are errors in it, and again, Concord should be very much concerned about that permit that will be coming. It, it can be a very determining factor. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.
Yes, hello, I'm a Ainsley Brennan, 14 Breezy Point Road. We've lived in Acton for 25 years. I just wanted to express my thanks for the commitment expressed uh, by Concord uh, to take care of the pair of eagles that we're now so lucky to have. I am really lucky because I get a front row seat. They come to my farm all the time. Uh, well, not so much the female now because she is now incubating. How do I know she's incubating? Down in my pasture, there's a little corner and if I take a um, pair of binoculars, there's not much understory over there. I can see her, and if I watch carefully, I see occasionally she'll get up, shift her position, and then get back down. I have seen the male carry various things to the nest, um, including a huge trail of moss, which I've since learned keeps uh, fleas and mites away from the nest, so we might want to use that sometime. Um, or put moss around my dog's neck, maybe. <laughs> maybe it works with ticks. So um, I did want to say, but I also did take note of Concord saying that it intends to monitor the eagles. And I do want to just give a little example about how really carefully this monitoring must be done. I, I do think that Concord had its aluminum boat out there the other day, and as it approached the bulbous peninsula where the eagle's nest is, I, I heard them cut the motor. I'm not sure that that's what they were doing, but I wanted to say that in the past few years, there's been a speed skater on Nagog Pond that the Acton police just cannot catch. I've called them a couple of times on him. Then last year I thought, oh, all right, fall through the ice, go ahead. And, but then I saw him again this year and an eagle flew over him and went towards the bulbous peninsula and he followed that eagle and he got close. And as soon as he was close, one eagle came out and started to circle around him making distress calls. Now that's a quiet skater on, on making very little noise. So I would urge Concord to consider that perhaps the best monitoring might be no monitoring at all and just keep away from that incredibly built uh, uh, piece of architecture that's, that's out there in Nagog Pond. I also want to thank you for entertaining the idea of allowing the Breezy Point residents to continue to go through so we can get act, keep our access to the Nagog Pond trails. I didn't quite understand. Uh, it's, it seemed to have a double meaning there. It was, sort of seemed like the Lord can giveth, but he can also take away. That's That's... That's nothing at all. That's no commitment at all. So if anyone wants to make further clarifications about that, but it just just seemed to be nothing. Um, but anyway, uh, I thank you very much. I know we're not supposed to do this, but I did name the eagles. I apologize. I named them Isaac after Isaac B. Davis and Isaac B. Davis's wife, Hannah. So anyway, they are doing well, and I expect their eggs, if they haven't hatched already, will soon hatch. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lillian Stokes. I live at 90 Skyline Drive. I'm a nationally recognized wildlife expert. And um, thank you, Ainsley. And Ainsley is being um, very sweet. And I think the Eagles want to thank Ainsley because she has been absolutely incredible in uh, being very careful to monitor and document the Eagles that are, that are breeding. Uh, it's a quite a big deal, and we should all be very happy. And what a big irony that our national symbol that hasn't bred in this area for years, that was that's on the Massachusetts threatened list of birds, uh, has chosen at this moment to nest on the Gog Pond. I mean, it, it's really quite uh, quite remarkable, which speaks to how great the Gog Pond is for wildlife. Eagles require a certain habitat protection in an, in an almost an island kind of environment uh, from predators that would swim across, uh, good fishing, quality of fish, quality of the environment. 
So I think the best way, and by the way, eagles are protected by uh, the National Bald Eagle Management Guidelines, which among other things helps protect eagles uh, comp comply with the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act that uh, avoids disturbing bald eagles' nests. This is the primary federal wildlife law to protect bald eagles. It covers very heavy fines if eagles are not protected. Um, <clears throat> so it's up to Concord to coordinate with the, the uh, Fish and Wildlife Coordinator to make sure that he is aware of everything that goes on. And if you haven't told him that you have actual uh, confirm, and I can confirm because I'm a wildlife expert that what she is saying is true behavior of incubation of bald eagles. Soon the young will hatch, they'll be in their, the nest for quite a while. They require fish, they require no disturbance. So I hope Concord takes note here and makes sure that they notify the uh, proper authorities, and I think other people should as well. The best way to protect the eagles is to not build the plant. Um, these eagles will be here for years to come. I mean, we should celebrate that. I think there are, there are all the uh, things that have been said are great reasons uh, about why, in your duty, you should vote down the permit and join with uh, Acton to protect our water. But speaking from the point of view of the eagles, I think that it's uh, really inappropriate to build this plant here at this time. So hopefully the eagles will be here for years to come. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Pete Shanahan, 128 Nonset Path, and I'm also the uh, active member on the ORS uh, Board of Directors. And I spoke with you at our earlier hearing about ORS concerns about the cold water fishery in Nagog Brook. And we really have just a question. Um, section 3.3.8 talks about uh, damage to the environment in or adjacent to Nagog Pond. Adjacent, I guess, can be a bit of a slippery word. We just wanted to know if you consider Nagog Brook to be covered by that. I can ask a council to respond. I think we left it vague on purpose, but I can ask uh, Mr. Roloffs to elaborate. That was intentionally left vague. Vague. So if there's a situation that involves Nagai Brook that the selectmen want to attempt to exert jurisdiction over through an enforcement under this provision, the vague, vagueness of, of it gives them potentially some ability to do that. Um, remember that this was a provision that was, uh, it, it's one of the provisions that's challenged in its entirety in the litigation. So there is a, a you know, a compromise that's reflected there, obviously, especially in this latest iteration where we're acknowledging that Concord objects to the provision even as it's written. So it's intentionally vague. Okay, thank you. Um, we continue to have concerns about particularly the deep intake in the proposed uh, plans that would allow for the pond to be drawn down much, much further than it has in the past and that would Greatly, if that were to happen, the amount of groundwater flowing from the pond down at the brook below would be greatly reduced and that would affect the cold water fishery. Um, Concord has said that they don't intend to draw it down that far. I don't see the purpose of the deep intake otherwise. So that, that deep intake allows for very potential, very, very significant potential changes in the aesthetics and the character of Nagog Pond. And I, I felt, as an engineer, I failed to see a purpose to that deep intake. So thank you. Thank you. Um, Mary Lynn Miller, Five Patrick Henry Circle. Um, I get very confused by all the legal language. I'm a retired physician. It doesn't mean I'm not intelligent, just uh, not up on the legal legs. But um, I see nothing in this proposal beneficial to Acton. All the things that economists call negative externalities befall the neighborhood adjacent to Niagara Pond, across the Niagara Pond, and Littleton. And I think, it, you know, again, big picture, it abrogates for generations, if not into perpetuity, the rights of Acton and Littleton, it could, uh, to withdraw the waters of Nagog Pond. 
which I could see as a necessity in the future. And I really don't understand all the uh, governmental um, ways to guard our rights, but I hope that our select persons don't succumb to battle fatigue. <laughs> I, think, I think we should do what's best for our residents of Acton and please try to secure our water rights. Um, I don't know if it means it has to go back to land court in July or join Littleton going before the SCJ, but um, I know you can get very focused on the narrow um, aspects of it, but the big picture is I really think for generations to come, water will only become more important um, when the act was written in 1884, I looked at the population, it was two th under 2,000, we're now at 23,000, build out is 30,000, plus if you have development, a lot of development requires more water than people drinking water for their homes. So I really would like to do what, I would hope that what could be done is to do whatever we can to secure our water rights for the future, even though it's not the, it is in some way affected by this proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Virginia Harris. I live at 13 Orchard Drive. As a constituent, I urge you to vote no against this petition. And I would like to add that I think that not only voting no would help Acton residents I think it would help Littleton residents, and I think in the long term it would help Concord residents, at least those who care anything about the, the environment in general, and I think that that constituency is growing even in Concord. So I think that on everyone's behalf, um, you would do well to vote this petition down. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I don't, is anybody else? Yeah. Okay. Tara Fredericks, West Acton. First, I have some questions. Um, was this drafted by Concord? No, these are, these were draft modifications that were part of settlement negotiations, so they were drafted by both parties. It, it seems that most of this document is to justify your approval by, um, indicating uh, why this is so good for Acton. And I haven't heard one person from Acton, um, except the people on the board here, um, to say that they want this. And I wanna just read for the audience that they can only approve this if, if it's not detrimental or injurious to the neighborhood. That's it. Um, it it's my belief that if the judge felt like we were that wrong, they would have already ruled. The fact that they remanded this back to a hearing indicates to me that, it, that it's worth letting it go to court. Um, and specifically in here, there are a couple of inaccuracies. Um, it suggests that the Acton Water District comments uh, we do not see a direct correlation. Well, they admitted afterwards that they didn't see the correlation. That doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. So if, in fact, you're actually defending the town, I think it's important to uh, indicate that, as opposed to handing um, and, and, and validate or uh, including stuff like that in um, an agreement, actually acting like you think that's true. Um, So um, my next question is, where, where does this, in fact, acknowledge that this won't impact Acton's rights to Nagog water? I couldn't find it, so I want to just ask that question. I'll ask counsel to answer that. Yeah, I do if you look at references. paragraph 3.4.1. Under limitations. There's an underlying heading there. It's called Acton's Right to Use Nagak Pond, and I'll just read it so the public understands it. Issues regarding the respective rights of Acton, Concord, and Littleton to use Nagak Pond as a drinking water supply are complex and are beyond the scope of this permitting process or decision. 
The board's issuance of this decision is not intended to diminish, limit, or advance in any way Acton's legal authority to use Nagak Pond as a water supply in the future. So if that's the case, then how can the size of the pipe and the ability to draw down the pond not be injurious to Acton's interests? You can ask that as a rhetorical question. I'm not no, going to I, I want, that. I want, I would okay. like I'm not going to answer, answer that. that. So you can submit it as a rhetorical question. So can okay. anybody answer that question? Again, I'm allowing it as a rhetorical question and not an I answerable see. one. Um, so if, if, we, if we were defending ourselves and our decision, we should at least include those um, Act and Water District and all of the technical experts' uh, condition uh, statements in, in this um, if we want to actually defend ourselves, because um, we've heard Janet say many times that we listen to you, that we listen to the public, and we're here begging you to say no. Um, now I want to get to my points. I want to make a couple corrections. The um, applicant had indicated that our terms were capricious because we had previously permitted a water treatment plant on the same site. But it's not the same water treatment plant. It's what, 440% bigger? Six, six, six times bigger? Okay. Um, the annual reporting, as Kim had said, is not enough. Um, They made the point that the Act and Water District, it's, it's, it's not enough to make action, to actually take action. T uh, using annual um, results basically give you enough information to tell them that they were wrong in the past, as opposed to stopping them from creating irreparable harm in the future. The claim that Act and Water District uses the same chemicals um, is not relevant because it, they don't do it, and they don't have that limit of trucks in the same area. The claim by the act, uh, the absurdity um, that they would draw down 25 foot, to me, it's equally, perhaps more absurd that the Board of Selectmen would approve the physical facility to allow them to do so. And I urge you to vote no, simply because it's too big. That's where the authority lies. You don't have to give any reasons. All you have to say is that it's too big. The pipe is too long, and it's too big. Um, I think I've already said that the judge would have already ruled if they felt like it was clearly in, in Concord's court. Uh, I don't think it is. The onus is on the applicant to prove in these um, court hearings that the special permit proposal is required. They have not yet proven to us that it's required, the size of the pipe, the size of the plant. I made a calculation based solely on the 1.5 million, not the 2.25 or whatever it is that, that the pipe would be capable of, but uh, at a dollar, I mean, at 30 cents, whatever it is that they sell it to, um, the residents, 10 cents, I think it was, it'd be $20 million a year in revenue. So is this really about needing drinking water? Is this really, has the applicant really proven that they need this? I urge you not to go on record at voting for this, to not go on record at presiding over, over a yes vote on this. I know that at least one person sitting at the table um, was on the Board of Selectmen when the Grace the, the, and Nuclear Metals, Conquer was kind enough to permit that, but also uh, Acton permitted the uh, Grace to uh, pollute our water effectively. And so I urge you not to go on record again with a yes vote. Thank you. Thank you. I urge you to vote no.
Hi, Barry Rosen, Windermere Drive. Uh, Katie, can I ask a question about council? You can ask it to me, and I can address it to okay. council. What are what are the what are the options for the vote? Sure. So council can lay those out. The options are just like they were in November. They can vote no to the modifications that are proposed, which would leave intact the original March 2017 decision, and that would lead to the litigation then proceeding. Um, they could vote yes to adopt the modifications, in which case the modified decision would supersede the March 2017 decision. That would be, it would be the final decision then. Um, and the, the board also could, in its deliberations, identify um, if, if there are revisions beyond those that have been discussed um, with Concord, they could entertain those as well. But the risk there being, unless there's discussion with Concord, the risk there being that uh, those revisions may not be, they may not resolve the litigation depending on what right. they are. That's all. OK. okay. So, so it, would that be like a no decision then, the third option? No. The third option would be, um, it would be a motion to further revise the modified decision that's been presented and then to adopt it. Got it. OK. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I got it. OK. So it's three, three ways they could go. Right. OK. Um, I'm going to try not to reiterate any of the other things that were said, and I'll try to keep it short, because obviously Peter's back is killing him. So. <laughs> uh, I guess it was, um, it was said uh, that, um, well, actually, there's a few things I want to make sure that they are not misconstrued by anybody. It was mentioned that, um, or, or try to imply that uh, Concord has a very good special relationship with the Water Supply District of Acton. I would say they have a relationship with them. I wouldn't call it a special relationship. Uh, the Acton, the Water Supply District of Acton is interconnected to Maynard. They're interconnected to Concord. They're interconnected to Littleton. Uh, so they each have interconnections. They have actually quite a, quite a number of connections to uh, Littleton. Littleton regularly has come in and supported the Acton Water District, especially when the Acton Water District guys are out with a, a break. Littleton has come in. They, they know the system very well. So there is a relationship, but I, I wouldn't make it out to sound like, and I don't want them to leave you with the perception it's anything special, that they cooperate particularly well. Uh, that wouldn't be the case. Uh, I can demonstrate personally that the Acton Water District, while I was present uh, on a committee that I serve on or, or chair for the Acton Water District, has asked the town of Concord to come a number of times to discuss water issues. I know Chris has called them at least twice, and they didn't want to discuss anything except Nagog Pond. They did not want to discuss anything else, so they didn't appear. However, they did appear when they were asking us for certain things. <clears throat> That's the only time they appeared uh, between the Wilmac and a joint meeting of the Wilmac and the Acton Water District. So you need to be aware of that. Uh, they're not particularly cooperative, uh, except that they need or want something, in my experience. Uh, the other thing is, um, <clears throat> excuse me, there was uh, a statement made I think by, by their attorney, actually, um, that um, Concord's government was a, I think the quote was, good stewards. Uh, I don't think I could agree with that. If they were good stewards, truly a good steward of the environment, uh, first of all, they would not have built a bus maintenance and fueling plant so close to the Axibet well, well fields. The Active Water District protested, did not want them to build. And there were a number of times uh, the then chair, well, he's chair again, <laughs> of the Acton Water District and I went to meet with their selectmen one evening to explain why we thought it was a dangerous thing to do that. And abruptly that evening, the agenda was changed and we were 
the subject was taken off their agenda at the selectmen's meeting. Uh, the commissioners tried to speak, and, and they did get uh, a minute and 20 seconds to speak to a town meeting. They were granted a minute and 20 seconds to explain to the town of Concord why the Acton Water District was upset and did not want this plant built, this uh, maintenance facility built. And that's it. They were essentially cut off. Uh, you probably still know, and the, if you go back and look at the minutes of the Acton Water District uh, Board of Water Commissioners, you will see that two of the three commissioners said it's not a question of if, it's a question of when there is a problem because there is a direct pervious and impervious path directly, well, not directly, that ends 100, according to the GIS map, 156 feet from the Assabet well fields. And why is that dangerous? Well, of course, they use solvents and all kinds of things up there, which can get, you know, run down. But the diesel fuel itself in New England has what they call anti-waxing agents, because otherwise it would coagulate and turn, turn to rock with a cold climate. So it's those agents that get into the ground and unfortunately, like MTBE, they move into water supplies almost instantaneously. They migrate very quickly. So you don't want that in the water. That's why they're so upset that plant was built there. And to top it off, there was a decision made. Of course, it sits on Superfund site, on a Superfund site. They drilled a well. And what came out of the well? One for dioxane, which upset both the EPA and the EPA contractors who were trying to clean up Acton's wells because the Maximus, the contractor selected by the EPA, was very upset because they thought that was impeding the cleanup of Acton's wells. It also served now to make a direct connection between the bedrock layer, which they drilled into, and the gravel layer above it. So they're now nicely connected with 1,4-dioxane. So, would I consider them good stewards of the environment? I think I'd have to disagree with their attorneys. I don't think they're particularly good stewards of the environment. I think the town tries to be, and the people, I believe, want to be. But I haven't seen that evidence by the behavior of their governmental representatives. Mr. Rosen, how much longer are your comments? I've given you well over five minutes at this point. So I'd ask you to please wrap them up. I think they can do it. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Okay, any other comments from the public? Okay, seeing none, then I'm going to ask the board. Um, we have to decide tonight if we want to close the hearing and then also if we want to deliberate and take a vote. So um, I will ask board members for your comments. Who's jumping to start? <laughs> Katie, Janet? can I, can yeah. I just oh, point out on. that you can deliberate while the hearing's open? No, no, we have to vote to close it and then whether or not to. Oh, we can deliberate. You, you right. can keep it open during right. your deliberations if you want to. And what that right. allows you to do then is to ask questions if they come up right. and to have further substantive input. So right. that would give you more flexibility, but yep. it's an option. Yeah, but we have to do both okay. votes tonight. Yeah. Um, so, Janet, do you want to start? We're just deliberating about where we stand. Um, yeah, I obviously, in order for us to reopen the hearing, uh, we had to have enough uh, members who were inclined to support this decision. Um, but un understanding that in the event that something new uh, came out during the hearing, uh, we might have to uh, change, make a change. Um, right now, I haven't, at this point, I have not heard anything that changes. Uh, my inclination to support this decision. I realize that that's going to disappoint people and given how contentious this issue has been and how, um, neg how much negativity, as somebody who wrote to us said, has abounded, um, none of which, frankly, is of our board's doing. Uh, we have maintained civility and decorum for two plus years while people in the audience uh, criticized us, sort of suggested that we weren't smart enough to figure these things out for ourselves, uh, slammed Concord, um, and, and 
today, tonight we heard people talking about things like disingenuous and whether people are or are, are, are not good stewards. Um, these are not issues that I find compelling uh, in my weighing of, of my decision. I think that it does come down to uh, it's a zoning decision. Um, the water issue is something that I hope that in the future we can get collaborative about with the other towns, but uh, there's gonna have to be some time uh, to allow tempers to cool uh, before anybody's going to be capable of talking about uh, regional planning, frankly. Uh, I find it interesting that there has been a change among some of the people who have been very vocally critical of the plant, saying we need to move forward, let's hold hands and have regional pl water planning and sing Kumbaya, uh, forgetting that we are right now trying to resolve um, a, a dispute with Concord, um, and that has been going on for two and a half years. So uh, I think that we have certainly talked about the need for planning generally not just with regard to water, everything. Uh, this is a peculiar form of government we have in Massachusetts where 351 ta towns have to do everything on their own until they realize that they can't. And then they start collaborating, but you know we don't have a strong county government uh, and there are all these efforts to try to encourage more collaboration, uh, including on water. Um, I just would, there are a few things that, anyhow, so the bottom line, I'm prepared to support this. I was making notes furiously as I do with big circles and arrows to say no, um, but I, I, you know, I think that first of all, somebody has brought up that Littleton had approached the Water District and Acton about having discussions. Uh, the person who brought that up at Monday's meeting was Ms. Castens, Dr. Castens, um, and as I mentioned then, it's true, the water district notified us that the Littleton water people were interested in talking uh, to the water district and including Acton reps. The town manager and I talked about it and I, I wrote back and I said, well, is Concord going to be included? The answer back was no, Concord is not going to be included and town manager and I agreed then we can't be involved in that because we're in the middle of active litigation and it would, it, the optics would be bad, everything would be bad. So it's not as if we weren't willing to consider it, but under, under the circumstances, it would, have been, it would have been impracticable for us to do that. It would have made things worse rather than better. You know, I don't know what Littleton is doing uh, and whether they're prepared to engage in discussions after we've moved on assuming we move on, but you know, I think that you need to understand that um, just because we haven't engaged in discussions in Littleton doesn't mean that we're so somehow falling down on the job. There were very specific reasons that we did not take up that, that offer. And um, anyhow, I, I, I think it's interesting that um, there's been encouragement for us to Oh, we could, it was sort of sarcastic. Uh, there was a lot of sarcasm tonight, um, and I, that did not escape me. I, I, it was probably fun for the people who were being sarcastic. I don't think it was helpful to me um, in, in weighing my decision, and it might have been a little off-putting for me, but um, it's interesting that there was a suggestion that we could uh, approve uh, the amended permit, and then we'd be free to pursue our water rights. And then the same person said, but don't approve the amended permit um, and still pursue, uh, pursue water rights and collaborate with Littleton. Honestly, if we are still dealing with this permit uh, decision, I don't think we're going to be talking to Littleton on the side. I don't think that's really realistic. Um, there was also a suggestion, why don't you ask Concord to move their proposed treatment plant to their own land? Um, you realize that in that instance, Concord wouldn't need our permission uh, to build a plant and we wouldn't have any kind of leverage whatsoever with regard to, they, they would go off and do Nagog Pond stuff and it would be remain to be seen whether what we would do. Um, and the trails, okay, um, the trails. Uh, people want access to the trails. I've said this before, I will say it again. 
Concord has aggregated 60 acres of land in Acton, 40 acres in Littleton, 100 acres total. It is largely, it's undeveloped. There's the one treatment plant building on it, and it is beautiful. And so it is lovely, uh, pristine uh, habitat for wildlife. Um, it is very much like what uh, the, what the Quail Ridge a Golf Course, now um, nine holes and a subdivision used to be before the golf course. Um, those of us who have been in town long enough have seen that. Um, that, result, that development of that parcel resulted in fragmentation. Um, and it's interesting to me that Acton has allowed development all around Nagog Pond. Um, the one swath of open space, aside from Nagog Hill, is this large parcel where, that Concord owns, which people seem to confuse as being open space, recreational. It's not. It's owned by Concord. It's a public entity, but it technically is not open to the public. It contributes value for people who live in the area, but it doesn't mean that people are entitled to go on the land. Uh, we are trying to accommodate people's wishes to go on the land, but frankly, there have been, there's been a lot of trespassing on the land, and Concord, as, as a manager of a public water surface water supply, has some legal responsibilities to maintain security. So in the event that something happens, they're going to have to close off access. There have been people, well, there's the speed skater who can't be caught. There's also somebody who was swimming and sunbathing nude on a rock. I, it just, you, you know, all kinds of, and then the, the, the teenagers love to hang out there and drink and leave all of their trash there for somebody, probably from Concord, to clean up. So uh, anyhow, bottom line, I just am still inclined to support the permit. I have been found it rather distressing over the past two and a half years to hear people who pride themselves. I mean, Acton residents are smart. They're well-educated. And I've just been surprised to hear people who also should know something about the scientific method. I'm not a scientist, but I appreciate it, who are cherry picking information to support what their, their, they, the conclusion is that they want and that they're trying to persuade us is the correct one. And you know, um, I'm a lot of things. I'm not the smartest person in the room. I've never claimed to be. There are plenty of people in Acton who do, uh, whether or not they are. And I, um, I, but I find it insulting sometimes that people are presenting things to us and expecting that we're not going to see behind the curtain what's actually going on. So that's all for now, anyway. OK, thank you. Peter, any comments from you? I have a little uh, different perspective to start off. I just want to say I think it was inappropriate and, frankly, obnoxious for um, a submittal that attacked a uh, citizen individually. Uh, and, uh, you know, we received, for some reason, emails from the selectmen cheering you on. I don't know why they came to us, <laughs> but uh, I assume that reflected uh, the re desires of uh, the selectmen to um, attack an individual um, who, in my view, is simply a respected scientist who's in good faith trying to present her arguments about why um, this proposal should not be approved. Um, on the other hand, uh, most of the complaints about this project are based on the fact of the impacts of increased water withdrawals on Acton's resources and on Nagog Pond itself. That decision has already been made. The Water Management Act made that decision in 1988. Concord has a state licensed right to withdraw an average of 105 million gallons of water a day from Nagog Pond. Whether you agree or not that that's the best water management policy that should be applied in the state, that is what the law is. And our dealing with that issue is way beyond the scope of the Zoning Act and the Zoning Bylaw. I would hope that 100 years from now, when the Acton historian looks at this project, Nagog Pond is a flourishing ecosystem with eagles and loons and all kinds of wildlife all over the place. I was at the first Earth Day in Cambridge in 1970, and I've been an ecologist ever since. But I'm also a lawyer, and I have to apply um, the legal principles of the Zoning Act to this 
project. Um, what I hope the historian would look, look at is the statements that Acton Water District has made that there is no connection between the waters of Nagog Pond and Acton's groundwater supply, that the granite bedrock that contains Nagog Pond doesn't allow a connection between Nagog Pond and the groundwater, and that the Acton Water District sees no current need to have to access water from Nagog Pond in order to provide potable water to act in residents in the future. All their plans are that they have enough water in the ground to meet the needs of Acton going forward in the future. And I realize that that opinion um, has been contested here and is contrary to um, what um, other facts and figures other citizens have presented, but in my view, we elect the commissioners and they hire the employees of the water district to do the job of making sure that Acton's water sources are protected and there'll be sufficient water supply for the future. And if I'm not a scientist, I'm not a geologist, I'm not a water expert, if I'm presented with two uh, conflicting opinions regarding that issue, I'm going to go with the people who have been running the water district for the last hundred years and whose job it is um, that we charge them with to um, tell us these issues. So if you get down to the issue that the Zoning Act addresses in this kind of a proceeding, the size of the building on 60 acres is not, in my view, um, adverse to the neighborhood. Over the last 100 years, residential neighborhoods have grown up around the site. Um, I don't believe that there, that, that um, plant will impose on the neighborhoods. We've tried to impose conditions on the deliveries of chemicals through the neighborhoods, time and um, whatever, um, to lessen the impact of that. That is what the Zoning Act is intended to do. And in my mind, we've met that obligation under the Zoning Act. Other issues, uh, <clears throat> the environmental issues, at, at Concord under that language can't just say, well, you know, we, we, we've um, substantially impaired the environment and therefore we have a right to do it because we reserved our rights in the, in the, in the agreement. Um, if we felt that, that Concord was um, um, degrading the environment, uh, we would take them to court, and, uh, and a court would decide. That's all that language means, is Concord uh, hasn't waived any rights to uh, litigate the issue if uh, it becomes a dispute in the future. On, on, the, on the trails, in a capitalist society, we don't have the right to impose uh, land takings by impose requiring Concord to provide easements to people across their private land. We would lose that in a second in court. So we've tried to craft language that um, encourages the parties to work together. Concord's shown a good faith um, intention, in my view, during these uh, negotiations to uh, work out <laughs> trails that would allow Breezy Point residents to access uh, the Nagog uh, uh, Hill uh, Conservation Area, and I'm, I'm expecting that to happen. But I think the language that we've uh, put in there is, uh, is as far as we can go. So um, for those reasons, I, I support um, <coughs> this uh, revised agreement. Thank you, Peter. Joan, comments? Okay, John, comments? Okay. Um, you know, this issue, uh, Nagog Pond, how you would have voted a Nagog Pond, came up in the selectman's race that Tara and I ran in February and March. Um, when I announced my candidacy, Tara said, where, did you stay, where do you stand on Nagog Pond? And I said, I would have voted in favor of the um, modified decision uh, back in November. And that 
bought me a contested race. Um, the issue, as I've tried to frame it for people, is it is not about Concord's right to draw water from Nagog Pond. That right has been established by the legislature. It needs to be changed by the legislature. We are here sitting as a permitting authority under the zoning bylaw. The question for us is whether the proposed siting and configuration of the treatment plant um, complies with the zoning bylaw criteria or not. The March 2017 decision, which still stands, decided um, that it does, and I certainly support that. Um, Section 10.3.6 of the zoning bylaw gives the board as permitting authority the ability to impose conditions, safeguards, and limitations we deem appropriate to protect the neighborhood of the town. We have done that, and those are set out in the modified decision. Now, in saying that, it's, it's important to note that imposing conditions, safeguards, and limitations, we cannot exceed our authority in doing so. And in the March 2017 decision, we did that in a number of respects. So by way of example, we can't condition the approval and require Concord to continue to provide water to two-way customers as they have for the last hundred years. We can't condition it on a prohibition prohibiting chemical delivery trucks from using roads um, in Acorn Park, or we can, can we order Concord effectively taking an easement on their property by providing a trail access across their lands to Breezy Point residents to access the Nagog Hill Conservation Area. We've really done the very best we can. Um, I think both lawyers on both sides should be commended for doing what lawyers should be doing and bringing out the best in lawyers and keeping the discussions going over probably eight to nine negotiating sessions to get where we, where we are today. Um, we've been at this for two and a half years now. These proceedings do need closure. Um, it is too bad that, and I would join with Peter and what Mr. Derning included about Ms. Kasdan's and her letter in, 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 their, in their submission the other day. Um, some of the stuff came flying back tonight because once it's said, it's responded to in kind. Um, Emotions have to cool. There are hurts on both sides that are going to take a lot of time to heal. Acton and Concord need to move in their own directions. So I will vote in favor of the modified decision this evening. Thank you, John. John, anything? Yeah. Well, I haven't spent two and a half years, and I'm not a lawyer, but I have been here for a year, and I have listened to all of the concerns on both sides. I have voted against, and I continue to vote against tonight. I think some of the issues have not been resolved to my satisfaction on co-water fishery, service to 2A, some of the other issues, and I know some of them are beyond the zoning on a specific site, but I think we need to have some things written down so that everybody understands them. So I will continue to vote no. Okay. Thank you, Joan. 
So I went back to my notes from the last um, November 2017 hearing and found that largely my comments are, are the same as those. And it starts with thanking everybody, the residents here tonight, for um, your activism and engagement in this process. You know, I, I remarked that we've been involved in there. Some of us here have been involved in this for two and a half years, and, and so have you, so or many of you. So we, we do appreciate that. And I do want to say that we have been listening. I think some people confuse that when, you know, in the end, I may disagree with you, you think I haven't listened to you, and, and that's not true. I have, and I've, I've tried to listen and consider the opinions on, on both sides. It's just I think that I've come to a different conclusion from many of the people in the audience. Um, and so, you know, my, my points are reiterating a lot of what John and, and Peter spoke about, about how this is a, a zoning decision, and that honestly the issues around um, water withdrawal need to be resolved at the state level. And, and I don't think that those issues uh, end here tonight, as some of the residents you know, spoke about. They are things that we should continue talking about, but we need to talk about with Concord and Littleton and probably in an even bigger region. And frankly, that needs to be resolved um, at the state level with the legislature, with DEP, and, and with others. Um, and, and so I think we should continue to have those conversations. My real hope is that this process hasn't damaged the relationships so much that we can't have those. Um, there have been a lot of things said on all uh, uh, people from all, I, I don't like the use, somebody, somebody talked about sides earlier, and I don't actually like that use. I don't think there's sides in this. Um, but people from all, all uh, parties involved have uh, you know, made comments that I think have been hurtful and damaging to these relationships. And as John noted, I think it will take a cooling down period, but I hope that we can come out of that stronger and um, better and, and work towards um, resolving these issues in a way that, that will be uh, environmentally appropriate for the entire state. But again, I think that needs to happen at the state level, not by an act in uh, zoning authority. Um, so, you know, again, I, I think that our, the conditions that we have left in here do address the zoning concerns around traffic and construction and noise and other things, and I think those are the issues that we really have the authority to um, have conditions around. Um, and so to me, I think that this um, modified decision meets our, our zoning requirements, and therefore I will be supporting um, this modified decision. So with that, Jeff, do yeah, you just wanna... Yeah, procedurally, if the board's content with the information now, I would suggest a two-step approach. One, just a, a motion to close the public hearing, and then after that, a motion to approve the modified decision. Okay, so first take a motion on closing the public hearing. I move to close the public hearing. A second. Okay, are there any other comments on closing the hearing? All right, seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, and then I'll take a motion on the decision itself. Move to approve the modified decision uh, draft dated 4 19 2018. Okay, I'm going to ask everybody if you could please keep your voices down if you are leaving, because we're taking votes and continuing this meeting right now. So Janet's made a motion to approve. Is there a second? Okay. Any other questions or comments from board members? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Any abstentions? Okay, that vote passes 4-1. Okay, then I will take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any abstentions? 